This is disgusting. This is awful in every way. If I could kill it, I would. But I legally can't. Hello! Hi everyone! Hi Sir Fox Love, thank you for coming by! <laughs> well timed, well timed. Hi Sophie! Hmm. Yeah, sorry for the late start. A bit late. Um. So. Me who? But yeah, so we'll be picking back up with um, next chapter of Lord of the Rings. We'll ship at the ring. Sick and ready for story time. Oh, I'm sorry you feel it bad. I hope the story is able to take your mind off of it. But uh, we're about ready to start chapter 7 in the house of Tom Bombadil. Um, last time, the, the hobbits is... <laughs> in the fortress. Um, maybe some other, t maybe some other time, maybe in the future someday. Um, r wrong inkling. Um, uh, so anyway, last time the, the hobbitses, they finally, they got away from the, uh, uh, from the Shire. And so they made their way into the, the old forest, whatever, the spoopy forest. And they got turned in around or whatever, and then a tree started, a willow tree started somewhere messing with them and trying to eat their friends. Um, well, suffocate more, but you know. anyway, <laughs> close enough. Um... But uh, then uh, Tom Bombadil showed up, escorting him into his house. So we're going to see how that turns um, out. We will we'll change music, though. Um, for that... Uh, 
I think I remember. No, wait, no. Wait, I think this. All right. Chapter 7 in the House of Tom Bombadil. The four hobbits stepped over the wide stone threshold and stood still blinking. They were in a long, low room filled with the light of lamps swinging from the beams of the roof, and on the table of dark, polished wood stood many candles, tall and yellow, burning brightly. Oh, hey, Jet. Welcome on. Come in. I see you stop by. Hmm. Sir. Uh... Jet here is an old friend of mine that was actually, um, was, uh, uh, uh ran a D&D &D campaign I was a part of. Um, and, uh, he actually helped me get, uh, this, uh, this model up and running. Well, help, I see. He was able to get it to the right format. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Four hobbits stepped over the wide stone threshold and stood still, blinking. They were in a long, low room filled with the light of lamps swinging from the beams of the roof. On the table of dark, polished wood stood many candles, tall and yellow, burning brightly. In a chair at the far side of the room, facing the outer door, sat a woman. Her long yellow hair rippled down her shoulders. Her gown was green, green as young reeds, shot, to, shot with silver, like beads of dew. And her belt was of gold, shaped like a cha chain of flag lilies set with pale blue eyes of forget-me-nots. About her feet, in wide vessels of green and brown earthenware, white water lilies were floating, so that she seemed to be that she seemed to be enthroned in the midst of a great pool. Enter, enter good guests, she said, she said. As she spoke, they knew it was her clear voice that they heard sing. They came a few timid steps further into the room and began to bow low, feeling strangely surprised and awkward. Like folk that, knocking at a cottage do door to beg for a drink of water, had been answered by a fair young elf queen clad in living flowers. Before they could say anything, he sp sprang lightly up and over the lily bowls and ran laughing towards them. And as she she ran, her gown rustled softly like the wind in the flow flowering borders of a river. Come, dear folk, she said, taking Frodo by the hand. Laugh and be merry. I'm Goldberry, daughter of the river. Then lightly she passed them, and closing the door, she turned her back to it, with her white arms spread out across it. Let us shut out the night, she said, for you are still afraid, perhaps of mist and tree shadows and deep water and untamed things. Fear nothing, for tonight you are under the roof of Tom Bombadil. The hobbits looked at her in wonder, and she looked at each of them and smiled. Fair Lady Goldberry! said Frodo at last, feeling his heart moved with a, a joy that he did not understand. He stood as he had at times stood enchanted by fair elven voices, but the spell that was na la now laid upon him was different. Less keen and lofty was the delight, but deeper and nearer to mortal heart, marvelous and yet not strange. Fair Lady Goldberry, said, now the joy that was hidden in the songs we heard is it plain to me. It's made plain to me. O oh, slender as a willow wand, O oh, clearer than clear water, O oh, reed by the living pool, fair river daughter, 
O oh, springtime and summertime, and spring again after, O oh, wind on the waterfall, and the leaves laughter. Suddenly he stopped and stammered, overcome with surprise to hear himself saying such things. But Goldberry laughed. Welcome, she said. I had not heard that folk of the Shire were so sweet-tongued, but I see that you are an elf friend. The light in your eyes and the ring in your voice tells it. This is a merry meeting. Sit now and wait for the master of the house. He will not be long. He is tending your tired beasts. The hobbit sat down gladly in low, rush-seated chairs, while Goldberry busied herself about the table. Their eyes followed her, for the slender grace of her movement filled them with quiet delight. From somewhere behind the house came the sound of singing. Every now and again they caught, among many a dairy doll and a merry doll, and a ring-a-ding dillo, the repeated words, Old Tom Bombadil is a merry fellow, bright blue his jacket is, and his boots are yellow. A fair lady, said Frodo again after a while, tell me, my asking does not seem foolish. Who is Tom Bombadil? He is, said Goldberry, staying her swift moments and smiling. Frodo looked at her questioningly. He is as you have seen him, she said in answer to his look. He is the master of wood, water, and hill. Then, all this strange land belongs to him? No, indeed, she answered in a small faded. That would indeed be a burden. She added in a low voice as if to herself, the trees and the grasses and all things growing or living in the land each belong each to themselves. Tom Bombadil is the master. No one has ever caught old Tom walking in the forest, wading in the water, leaping on the t hilltops under light and shadow. He has no fear. Tom Bombadil is master. A door opened and in came Tom Bombadil. He had now no hat, and his thick brown hair was crowned with autumn leaves. He laughed and going to Goldberry took her hand. Here's my pretty lady, he said, bowing to the hobbits. Here's my Goldberry, clothed all in silver green, with flowers in her girdle. Is the table laden? I see yellow cream and honeycomb, and white bread and butter. Milk, cheese, and green herbs and ripe berries gathered. Is that enough for us? Is the supper ready? It is, said Goldberry, but the guests perhaps are not. Tom clapped his hand, hands and cried, Tom, Tom, your guests are tired. You had near forgotten. Come now, my merry friends, and Tom will refresh you. You shall clean grimy hands and wash your weary faces. Cast off your muddy cloaks and comb out your tangles. He opened the door and they followed him down a short passage and round a sharp turn. They came to a low room with a sloping roof. A penthouse, it seemed, built on to the north end of the house. Its walls were of clean stone, but they were mostly covered with green hanging mats and yellow curtains. The floor was flagged and strewn with fresh green rushes. There were four deep mattresses, each piled with white blankets, laid on the floor along one side. Against the opposite wall was a long bench laden with er wide earthen ware basins, and beside it stood brown ewers filled with water, some cold, some steaming hot. There were soft green slippers set ready beside each bed. Before long, washed and refreshed, the hobbits were seated at the table, two on each side, while at either side sat Goldberry and the master. It was a long and merry meal, though the hobbits ate, only, as only finished hobbits can sit eat, there was no lack. The drink in their drinking bowls seemed to be clear cold water, yet it went to their hearts like wine and set free their voices. The guests became suddenly aware that they were singing merrily, as if it was easier and more natural than talking. At last, Tom and Gold er, hold her eh. Tom and Goldberry rose and cleared the table swiftly. The guests were commanded to sit quiet, and were set in chairs, each with a footstool to his tired feet. There was a fire in the wide hearth before them, and was burning with a sweet smell, as if it were built of apple wood. When everything was in order, all the lamps in the room were put out, except one lamp and a pair of candles at each end of the ch chimney shelf. Then Goldberry came and stood between them, holding a candle, and she wished them a good night and a deep sleep. Have peace now, she said, until the morning. Eat no nightly noises. 
for nothing passes door and window here save moonlight and starlight and the wind off the hilltop. Good night. She passed out of the room with a glimmer and a rustle. The sound of her footsteps was like a stream falling gently away downhill over cool stones in the quiet of night. Sam sat on a while beside them in silence, while each of them tried to muster the courage to ask one of the many questions he had meant to ask at supper. Sleep gathered on their eyelids at last, Frodo spoke. Did you hear me calling, Master? Or was it just chance that brought you at that moment? Tom stirred like a man shaken out of a pleasant dream. Huh? What? Said he. Did I hear you calling? No, yeah, I did not hear. I was busy singing. Just chance brought me then, if chance you call it. It was no plan of mine, though I was waiting for you. We heard news of you, and learned that you were wandering. We guessed you'd come ere long down to the water. All paths lead that way, down to with her window with the windle old gray willow man he's a mighty singer it's hard for little folk to escape his cunning mazes but tom had an errand there that he dared not hinder tom nodded as if sleep was taking him again but he went on in a soft voice sing, si singing voice i had an errand there gathered water lilies green lily leaves and lilies white to please my pretty lady the last day of the year's end to keep them from the winter, to flower by her pretty feet till the snows are melted. Each year at summer's end, I go to find them for her, in a wide pool deep and clear far down with the window. There are open first in spring, and there they linger le latest. By that pool long ago I found the river daughter, fair young Goldberry sitting in the rushes. Sweet was her singing then, and her heart was beating. He opened his eyes and looked at them with a sudden glint of blue. That proved well for you, for now I shall no longer go down deep again along the forest water, not while the year is old, nor shall I be passing old man Willow's house this side of springtime, not till the merry spring when the river daughter dances down the withy path to bathe in the water. He fell silent again, but Frodo could not help asking one more question, the one he most desired to have answered. Tell us, Master, he said, about the Willow Man. What is he? I have never heard of him before. No, don't, said Merry and Pippin together, sitting suddenly upright. Not now, not until the morning. That's right, said the old man. Now is the time for resting. Some things are ill to he hear when the world's in shadow. Sleep till the morning light, rest on the pillow. Heed no nightly noise, fear no gray willow. And with that, he took the, down the lamp and blew it out, and grasping a candle in either hand, he led them out of the room. Their mattresses and pillows were soft as down, and the blankets were of white wool. They had hardly laid themselves on the deep beds and drawn the light covers over them before they were asleep. In the dead night, Frodo lay in a dream without light. Then he saw the young moon rising, under its thin light there loomed before him a black wall of rock, pierced by a dark arch like a great gate. It seemed to Frodo that he was lifted up, and passing over he saw that the rock wall was a circle of hills, and that within it was a plain, and in the midst of the plain stood a pinnacle of stone, like a vast tower, not made by hands. On its top stood the figure of a man, the moon as it rose seemed to hang for a moment above his head and glistened in his white hair as the wind stirred it up from the dark plain below came the crying of fell voices and the howling of many wolves suddenly a shadow like the shape of great wings passed across the moon the figure lifted his arms and in a light flashed from the staff that he wielded a mighty eagle swept down and bore him away the voices wailed and the wolves yammered there was a noise like a strong wind blowing, and on it was borne the sound of hoofs, galloping, galloping, galloping from the east. Black riders, thought Frodo as he wakened, the sound of the hoofs still echoing in his mind. He wondered if he would ever again have the courage to leave the safety of these stone walls. He lay motionless, still listening, but all was now silent, and at last he turned and fell asleep again, or wandered into some other unremembered dream. 
At his side, Pippin lay dreaming pleasantly, but a change came over his dreams and he turned and groaned. Suddenly he woke, or thought he had waked, and yet still heard in the darkness the sound that had disturbed his dream. Tip tap, squeak. The noise was like branches fretting in the wind. Twig fingers scraping wall and window. Creak, creak, creak. He wondered if there were willow trees close to the house, then suddenly had a dreadful feeling that he was not in an ordinary house at all, but inside the willow, and listening to that horrible, dry, creaking voice laughing at him again. He sat up and felt the soft pillows yield to his hands, and he lay down again relieved. He seemed to hear the echo of the words in his ears. Fear nothing. Have peace until the morning. Heed no nightly noises. Then he went to sleep again. The sound of water that Mary heard falling into his quiet sleep. Water streaming down gently and then spreading. Spreading irresistibly all around the house into a dark shoreless pool. It gurgled under the walls and was rising slowly but surely. I shall be drowned, he thought. It will find its way in and I shall drown. He felt that he was lying in a slough slop. Da, da, da. He felt that he was lying in a soft, slimy bog. Springing up, he set his foot on the corner of a cold, hard flagstone. Then he remembered where he was and lay down again. He seemed to hear or remember. He seemed to hear or remember hearing. Nothing passes doors or windows save moonlight and starlight and the wind of the hilltop. A little breath of sweet air moved the curtains. He breathed deep and fell asleep again. As far as he could remember, Slams, Sam slept through the night in deep content, if logs are contented. Wait, sorry, hold on one second. Continue. Uh... Thank you for the fluid check. They hmm. <sighs> woke up, all four at once in the morning light. Tom was moving about the, the room, whistling like a starling. When he heard them stir, he clapped his hands and cried, Hey, come merry doll, dairy doe, my hearties. He drew back the yellow curtains, and the hobbits saw that these had covered the windows at either end of the room, one looking east and the other looking west. They leapt up refreshed. Frodo ran to the eastern window and found himself looking into a kitchen garden, gray with dew. He had half expected to see turf right up to the walls, turf all pocked with hoof prints. Actually, his view was screened by a tall line of beans on poles, but above and far beyond them, the gray top of the hill loomed up against the sunrise. It was a pale morning, and the east behind long clouds like lines of soiled wool, stained red at the edges, lay glimmering deeps of yellow. The sky spoke of rain to come, but the light was broadening quickly and red flowers on the beans began to glow against the wet green leaves. Pippin looked out of the western window, down into a pool of mist. The forest was hidden under a fog. It was like looking down to a sloping cloud roof from above. There was a fold, or a channel where the mist was broken into many plumes and billows. The valley of the withy window. The stream ran down the hill on the left and vanished into the white shadows. Near at hand was a flower garden, an eclipsed hedge silver netted, and beyond that gray shaven grass pale with dewdrops, there was no willow tree to be seen. Good morning, merry friends, cried Tom, opening the eastern window wide. A cool air flowed in, 
It had a rainy smell. Sun won't show her face much today, I'm thinking. I have been walking wide, leaping on the hilltops, since the grey dawn began. Noising wind and weather, wet grass underfoot, wet skies above me. I awaken the goldberry singing under under window, but not was but not wakes hobbit folk in the early morning. In the night little folk wake up in the darkness and sleep after light has come. Ring a ding dillo, wake now, my merry friends. Forget the nightly noises. Ring a ding dillo dell. Derry dell, my hearties. If you'll come soon, you'll find breakfast on the table. If you come late, you'll get grass and rainwater. Needless to say, not that Tom's threats sounded very serious, the hobbits came soon and left the table late, and only when it was beginning to look rather empty. Neither Tom nor Goldberry were there. Tom could be heard about the house, clattering in the kitchen and up and down the stairs, and singing here and there outside. The room looked westward over the mist-clouded valley, and the window was open. Water dripped down from the thatched eaves above. Before they had finished break breakfast, the clouds had joined into an unbroken roof, and a straight gray rain came softly and steadily down. Behind its deep curtain, the forest was completely veiled. As they looked out of the window, the air came falling gently as it was flowing down the rain out of the sky, the clear voice of Goldberry singing up above them. They could hear few words, but it seemed plain to them that the song was a rain song, as sweet to showers on dry hills, that told the tale of a river from the spring in the highlands to the sea far below. The hobbits listened with delight, and Frodo was glad in his heart and blessed the kindly weather, because it, de because it delayed them from departing. The thought of going had been heavy upon him from the moment he awoke, but he guessed now that they would not go further that day. The upper wind settled in the west, and the deep er and wetter clouds rolled up to the spill their laden rain on the bare heads of the downs. Nothing could be seen all around the house but falling water. Frodo stood near the open door and watched the white, chalky path turn into a little river of milk and go bubbling away down into the valley. Tom Bombadil came trotting around the corner of the house, waving his arms as he was warding off the rain, and indeed, when he sprang over the threshold, he seemed quite dry except for his boots. These he took off and put in the chimney corner. Then he sat in the largest chair and called the hobbits together around him. This is Goldberry's washing day, he said, and her aut autumn cl cleaning. Too wet for hobbit folk. Let them rest while they are they are able. It's a good day for long tales, for questions and for answers. So Tom will start the talking. He then told them remarkable stories, sometimes has, half as if speaking to himself, sometimes looking at them suddenly with a bright blue eye under his deep brows. Often his voice would turn to song. He would get out of his chair and dance about. He told them of bees and flowers, the ways of trees, and the strange creatures of the forest, about the evil things and good things, things friendly and things unfriendly, cruel things and kind things, and secrets hidden under brambles. As they listened, they began to understand the lives of the forest, apart from themselves, indeed, to feel themselves as the strangers where all other things were at home. Moving constantly in and out of his talk was Old Man Willow, and Frodo learned now enough to content him, indeed more than enough, for it was not comfortable lore. Tom's words lay bare the heart of trees and their thoughts, which were often dark and strange, and filled with the hatred of things that go free upon the earth, gnawing, biting, breaking, hacking, burning, destroyers and usurpers. It was not called the old forest without reason, for it was indeed ancient, a survivor of vast forgotten woods, and in it there lived yet, aging no quicker than the hills, the fathers of the fathers of trees, remembering times when there were lords. The countless years had filled them with pride and rooted wisdom, and with malice, but none were more dangerous than the great willow. His heart was rotten, but his strength was green, and he was cunning, and a master of winds, and his song and thought ran through the woods on both sides of the river. 
His gray, thirsty spirit drew power out of the earth and spread like fine root threads in the ground and invisible twig fingers in the air till it had, till it had under its dominion nearly all the trees of the forest from the hedge to the downs. Suddenly, Tom's talk left the woods and went leaping up the young stream over bubbling waterfalls, over pebbles and worn rocks, and among small flowers and close grass and wet cra crannies. Wandering at last up on to the downs, they heard of the great barrows and the green mounds and the stone rings upon the hills and in the hollows among the hills. Sheep were bleeding in flocks, green walls and white walls rose. They were fortresses on the heights. Kings of little kingdoms fought together. The young sun shone like fire on the red metal of their new and greedy swords. There was victory and defeat, and towers fell, fortresses were burned, and flames went up into the sky. Gold was piled on the beers of fires of dead kings and queens, and mounds covered them. And the stone doors were shut, the grass grew over all. Sheep walked for a while, biting the grass, but soon the hills were empty again. A shadow came out of dark places far away, and the bones were stirred in the mountains. Barrow whites walked in the hollow places with a clink of rings on the cold fingers and gold chains in the wind. Stone rings grinned out of the ground like broken teeth in the moonlight. The hobbit shuddered. Even in the shire, the rumor of barrow whites of the barrow downs beyond the forest had been heard, but it was not a tale that any hobbit liked to listen to. Even by comfortable fires, I had far away. These four now suddenly remembered what the joy of this house had driven from their minds. The house of Tom Bombadil nestled under the very shoulder of those dreaded hills. They lost the thread of his tail and shifted uneasily, looking aside at one another. When they caught his words again, they found that he had now wandered into strange regions beyond their memory and beyond their waking thought into times when the world was wider and the seas flowed straight to the western shore. And still on and back, Tom went singing out into ancient starlight when only the elf sires were awake. Then suddenly he stopped and they saw that he nodded as if he was falling asleep. The hobbit sat still before him, enchanted, and it seemed as if, under the spell of his words, the wind had gone and the clouds had dried up and the day had been withdrawn and darkness had come from east and west, and all the skies were filled with, with the light of white stars. Whether the morning and the evening of one day or of many days had passed, Frodo could not tell. He did not feel either hungry or tired. Only filled with wonder, the stars shone through the window, and the silence of the heavens seemed to be round him. He spoke at last out of wonder, in a sudden fear of the silence who are you, master? He asked. Huh? What? Said Tom, sitting up, and his eyes glinting in the gloom. Don't you know my name yet? That's the only answer. Tell me, who are you, alone yourself and nameless? You are young, and I am old. Eldest, that's what I am. Mark my words, my friends. Tom was here before the river and the trees. Tom remembers the first raindrop and the first acorn. He made pass before the big people, and saw the little people arriving. He was here before the kings and the graves and the barrel whites. When the elves passed westward, Tom was here already, before the seas were bent. He knew the dark under the stars when it was fearless, before the dark lord came from the outside. A shadow seemed to pass by the window, and the hobbits glanced hastily through the panes. When they turned again, Goldberry stood in the door behind, framed in light. He held a candle shielding its flame from the drought with her hand, and the light flowed through it like sunlight through a white shell. The rain has ended, she said, and new waters are running downhill under the stars. Let us now laugh and be glad. And let us have food and drink, cried Tom. Long tales are thirsty, and long listenings hungry work, morning, noon, and evening. With that, he jumped out of his chair, and with a bound took a took a candle from the chimney shelf and lit it in the flame that Goldberry held. Then he danced about the table. Suddenly, he hopped through the door and disappeared. Quickly, he returned, 
carrying a large and laden tray. Then Tom and Goldberry set the table, and the hobbit sat him half in wonder and half in laughter. So fair was the grace of Goldberry and so merry and awed the caperings of Tom. Yet in some fashion they seemed to weave a single dance, neither hindering the, the other in and out of the room and round about the table, and with great speed food and vessels and lights were set in order. The boards blazed with candles, white and yellow. Tom bowed to his guests. Supper is ready, said Goldberry, and now the hobbits saw that she was clothed all in silver with a white girdle, and her shoes were like fish's mail. But Tom was all in clean blue, blue as, blue as rain-washed forget-me-nots, and he had green stockings. was this summer even bef better than before. The hobbits under the spell of Tom's words may have missed one meal or many. When the food was before them, it seemed at least a week since they had eaten. They did not sing or even speak much for a while and paid close attention to business. But after a time, their hearts and spirits rose high again and their voices rang out in mirth and laughter. After they had eaten, Goldberry sang many songs for them, songs that began merrily in the hills and fell softly down in silence, and in the silences they saw in their minds pools and waters wider than any they had known, and looking into them, they saw the sky below them and the stars like jewels in the depths. Then once, again, once more she wished them each good night and left them by the fireside, but Tom now seemed wide awake and plied them with questions. He appeared already to know much about them and all their families, and indeed know much of all the history and doings of the Shire down from days hardly remembered among the hobbits themselves. It no longer surprised them, but he made no secret that he owed his recent knowledge largely to Farmer Maggot, whom he seemed to regard as, as a person of more importance than they had imagined. There's earth under his old feet and clay on his fingers, wisdom in his bones, and both his eyes are open, said Tom. It was also clear that Tom had had dealings with the elves, and it seemed that in some fashion news had reached him from Gildor concerning the flight of Frodo. Indeed, so much did Tom know, and so cunning was his questioning, that Frodo found himself telling him more about Bilbo and his own hopes and fears than he had told bef before even to Gandalf. Tom wagged his head up and down, and there was a glint in his eyes when he heard of the riders. Show me the precious ring, he said, suddenly in the midst of the story, and Frodo, to his own ast astonishment, drew out the chain from his pocket, and unfastening the ring, handed it at once to Tom. It seemed to grow larger as it lay for a moment on his big brown's end hand. Then suddenly he put it to his eye and laughed. For a second the ho hobbits had a vision, both comical and alarming, of his bright blue eye gleaming through a circle of gold. Then Tom put the ring round the end of his little finger and held it up to the candlelight. For a moment, the hobbits noticed some nothing strange about this. Then they gasped. There was no sign of Tom disappearing. Tom laughed again, and then he spun the ring in the air and it vanished with a flash. Frodo gave a cry. Tom leaned forward and handed it back to him with a smile. Frodo looked at it closely and rather suspiciously, like one who has lent a trinket to a juggler. It was the same ring, or looked the same and weighed the same, for that ring had always seemed to Frodo to weigh strangely heavy in the hand. But something prompted him to make sure. He was perhaps a trifle annoyed with Tom for seeming to make so light of what even Gandalf thought so perilously important. He waited for an opportunity when the talk was going again, and Tom was telling an absurd story about the ba about badgers and their queer ways. Then he slipped the ring on. Mary turned towards him to say something and gave a start, and checked an exclamation. Frodo was delighted, in a way. It was his own ring, all right, but Mary was staring blankly at his chair, and obviously could not see him. He got up and crept away quietly from the fireside towards the other door. Hey there, cried Tom, glancing towards him with the most 
with the most seeing look in his shining eyes. Hey, come Frodo there. Where be you a-going? Old Tom Bombadil's not as blind as that yet. Take off your golden ring. Her hand's more fairer without it. Come back. Leave your game and sit down beside me. We must talk a while more and think about the morning. Must teach the right road and keep your feet from wandering. Frodo laughed, trying to feel pleased. And taking off the ring, he came and sat down again. Tom now told them that he reckoned the sun would shine tomorrow, that it would be a glad morning, and setting out would be hopeful. They would do well to start early, for weather in that country was a thing that even Tom could not be sure of for long, and it would change sometimes quicker than he could change his jacket. I am no weather master, said he, nor is aught that goes on two legs. By his advice, they decided to make nearly due north from his house, over the western and lower slopes of the downs. They might hope in that way to strike the east road in a day's journey and avoid the barrows. He told them not to be afraid, but to mind their own business. Keep to the green grass. Don't you go a meddling with the old stones or cold whites or prying into th their houses unless you be strong folks with hearts that never falter. He said this more than once, and he advised them to pass barrows by on the west side. They chanced to stray near one, then he taught them a rhyme to sing if they should be if they should by ill luck fall into any danger or difficulty the next day. Oh Tom Bombadil, Tom Bombadil, by water, wood, and hill, by the reed and willow, by fire, sun and moon, hearken now and hear us. Come Tom Bombadil, for our need is nearer us. When they had sung this all together after him, he clapped them each on the shoulder with a laugh and taking candles, led them back to their bedroom. Up, and we finished chapter seven. Oh, okay. Refill on my tea before I start the next chapter. But I hope everyone's enjoying things so far. Yes, yes. Pokemon, yes, once again, the Pokemon Smasher Pass will be on, uh, uh, be on Friday, and, uh, we'll have, uh, yes, and we will have our, our lovely guest, uh, Nyan Fu, who is, uh, the maker of different emotes, the lovely emotes we have. While I'm paused, let me go ahead and give my shout out. They've been streaming more and they're really good at uh, stuff. In this day in history, I have now died. Goodbye, cruel world. <laughs> I like how the clip that was there um was uh from one of their one of her art streams where she was actually working on my uh, reference sheet. Uh uh Very, very almost. She just has a few, apparently, of a few, uh, um, more final touches to do on them. 
And so I will definitely be um get it in the final version. I will definitely be of course sharing that. Um because then that also means I get another exciting thing. Um turned over turn that to someone to get turn that over to someone to get another um uh project which I am really, really excited. I thought I wasn't gonna be able to do sometimes that's as much hint as you're going to get for right now on that what type of things would you want to need a character reference oh no Gee, it's something he would no more hits no more hits no 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 more hints no you cannot force them from me no, 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 no. No more hints. Okay, we'll pick up. I feel like I need to change the music though. Um. Uh. Let's go with this. Thank you for the fluid check. Can't just leave us the... Talk dart you. Oh... Okay, I mean, what? Okay, I'll give another hint. Um, squeezing another hint out of me. What's one that wouldn't would make it too obvious? That would that that would be a good hint. Um, heard your lady's secrets. Um, let's see. I've already said it's something I thought I wouldn't be able to get, um, in quite some time. It needs a character sheet. Um, okay, I guess the other hint would be that I guess the other hint, <laughs> I knew it. Not a hat, not a hat. Um, but uh, um, it is something that um, uh, for for certain types of streamers um, is in is in is in great demand, and thus normally. One would have to pay uh, 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 a, a a a large sum of money on it. But I was able to find an outstandingly good deal um, on it on on the thing in question. That I need the character reference for. So, I, I, if I say anything else, I think I, I feel I'm gonna be practically giving it away. So, might have to think about that a smidge. But a sexy hot female cobalt soda pudding. <laughs> <laughs> Not, not quite, I don't think. Not quite. That that would be something. <laughs> okay. Alright. Continue reading. I'm not going to say any more. 
Give, give, give my hit. Okay, y'all made me sp spill some more beans. So, I'm not gonna spill any more beans. No more bean spilling. No more beans. I was wonder about to do that since I have the weight. And so, I was wondering. There was more, one more bean. Oh my gosh. <sighs> uh, what are we doing? Oh yeah. Okay. Back to the story. All right. Chapter eight. Hog on the Barrow Downs. That night, they heard no, no noises, but either in his dreams or out of them, could not tell which. Frodo heard a sweet singing running in his mind, a song that seemed to come like a pale light behind a gray rain curtain, and growing stronger to turn the veil all to glass and silver, till at last it was rolled back, and a far green country opened before him, under a swift sunrise. The vision melted into waking, and there was Tom whistling like a tree full of birds. And the sun was already slanting down the hill and through the open window. Outside everything was green and pale gold. After breakfast, which they again ate alone, they made ready to say farewell, as nearly heavy of heart was possible on such a morning cool bright and clean under a washed autumn sky of thin blue the air came fresh from the northwest their quiet ponies were almost frisky sniffing and moving restlessly tom came out of the house and waved his hat and danced upon the doorstep bidding the hobbits to get up and be off and go with good speed they rode off along a path that wound away from behind the house and went slanting up towards the north end of the hill for a wonder which it sheltered. They had just dismounted to lead their ponies up the last steep slope, when suddenly Frodo stopped. Goldberry, he cried, my fair lady clad all in silver green. We have never said farewell to her, nor seen her since the evening. He was so distressed that he turned back, but at that moment... A clear call came rippling down. There on the hillbrow hill she stood beckoning to them. Her hair was flying loose, and as it caught the sun it shone and shimmered. A light like the glint of water on dewy grass flashed from under her feet as she danced. They hastened up the last slope and stood breathless bef beside her. They bowed, but with a wave of her arm she bade them look around, and they looked out from the hilltop over the lands until the morning, under the morning was now as clear and far seen as it had been veiled and misty when they stood upon the knoll in the forest, which could now be seen rising pale and green out of the dark trees in the west. In that direction, the land rose in wooded ridges, green, yellow, russet under the sun, beyond which lay hidden the valley, valley of the brandy wine. To the south, over the line of the withy window, there was a distant glint like pale glass, where the Brandywine River made a great loop in the lowlands and flowed away out of the knowledge of the hobbits. Northward, beyond the dwindling downs, the land ran away in flats and swellings of gray and green and pale earth colors, until it faded into a featureless and shadowy distance. Eastward, the Barrow Downs rose ridge behind ridge into the morning and vanished out of house eyesight into a guess, which was no more than a guess of blue and a remote white glimmering blending with the hem of the sky, but it spoke to them out of memory and old tales of the high and distant mountains. They took a deep draught of the air and felt that a skip and a few stout strides would bear them wherever they wished. It seemed faint-hearted to go jogging aside over the crumpled skirts of the downs towards the road when they should be leaping, as lusty as Tom um, over the, the stepping stones of the hills, 
straight towards the mountains. Goldberry spoke to them and recalled their eyes and, and thoughts. Speed now, fair guests, she said, and hold to your purpose. North with the wind, with the left eye and a blessing on your footsteps. Make haste while the sun shines. And to Frodo she said, Farewell, elf friend. It was a merry meeting. But Frodo found no words to answer. He bowed low and mounted his pony, and followed by his friends, jogged slowly down the gentle slope behind the hill. Tom Bombadil's house in the valley and the forest were lost to view. The air grew warmer between the green walls of hillside and hillside, and the scent of turf rose strong and sweet as they breathed. Turning back, when they reached the bottom of the green hollow, they saw Goldberry, now small and slender like a sunlit flower against the sky. She was standing still watching them, and her hands were stretched out towards them, and as they looked, she gave a clear call, and lifting up her hand, she turned and vanished behind the hill. Their way... Their way wound blah, 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 blah. Their way wound along the floor of the hollow and round the green feet of a steep hill into another deep deeper and broader valley, and then over the shoulders of further hills, and down their long limbs and up their smooth sides again, up on to new hilltops and down into new valleys. There was no tree nor any visible water. It was a country of grass and short, springy turf, silent except for the whisper of the air over the edges of the land, and hind lonely cries of strange birds. As they journeyed, the sun mounted and grew hot. Each time they climbed a ridge, the breeze seemed to have grown less. When they caught a glimpse, a glimpse of the country westward, the distant forests seemed to be smoking, as if the fallen rain was steaming up again from leaf and root and, root and mold. A shadow now lay around the edge of sight, a dark haze above which the upper sky was like a blue cap, hot and heavy. About midday, they came to a hill whose top was wide and flattened, like a shallow saucer, with a green mounded rim. Inside, there was no air stirring, and the sky seemed to near their heads. They rode across and looked northwards. Then their hearts rose, for it seemed plain that they had turned further already than they had expected. Certainly the distances had now all become hazy and deceptive, but there could be no doubt that the downs were coming to an end. A long valley lay below them, winding away northwards, until it came to an opening between two steep shoulders. Beyond them, there seemed to be no more hills. Due north, they faintly glimpsed a long, dark line. That is a line of trees! said Mary, and that must mark the, the road all along, along it for many leagues east of the bridge. There are trees growing. Some say they were planted in the old days. Splendid, said Frodo. If we make, it, make us good going this afternoon, as we have done this morning, we shall have left the downs before the sun sets and be jogging on in search of a camping place. But even as he spoke, he turned his glance eastwards, and he saw that on that side the hills were higher and looked down upon them, and all those hills are crowned with green mounds, and on some were standing stones, pointing upwards like jagged teeth out of green gums. That view was somehow disquieting, so they turned from the sight and went down into the hollow circle. In the midst of it, there stood a single stone, standing tall under the sun above, and at this hour casting no shadow. It was shapeless, and yet significant like a landmark or a guiding finger, or more like a warning. They were now hungry, and the sun was still at the fearless noon, so they set their backs against the east side of the stone. It was cool, as if the sun had no power to return it, but at that time it's this seemed pleasant. There they took food and drink, and made as good a noon meal under the open sky as anyone could wish, for the food came from down under hill. Tom had provided them with plenty for the comfort of the day. Their ponies, unburdened, strayed upon the grass. Riding over the hills and eating their fill, the warm sun and the scent of turf, lying a little too long, stretching out their legs and looking at the sky above their noses, these things are, perhaps, enough to explain what happened. However that may be, they woke suddenly 
and uncomfortably from a sleep they had never meant to take. The standing stone was cold, and it cast a long pale shadow that st stretched eastward over them. The sun, a pale and watery yellow, was gleaming through the mist just above the west wall of the hollow, in which they lay a north, south, and east. Beyond the wall, the fog was thick, cold, and white. The air was silent, heavy, and chilled. Their ponies ponies were standing crowded together with their heads down. I think we better... change up... Uh... change up how things sound. The hobbits sprang to their feet in alarm and ran to the western rim. They found that they were upon an island in the fog. Even as they looked out in dismay towards the setting sun, it sank before their eyes into a white sea, and a cold gray shadow sprang up in the east behind. The fog rolled up to the walls and rose above them. As it mounted, it bent over their heads until it became a roof. They were shut in a hall of mist whose central pillar was the standing stone. They felt as if a trap was closing about them, but they did not quite lose heart. They had still remembered the hopeful view they had, they had had of the line of the road ahead, and they still knew in which direction it lay. In any case, they no, now had so great a dislike for that hollow place about the stone that no thought of remaining there was in their minds. They packed up as quickly as their chilled fingers would work. Soon they were leading their ponies in single file over the rim and down the long northward slope of the hill, down into a foggy sea. As they went down, the mist became colder and damper, and their hair hung lank and dripping on their foreheads. When they reached the bottom, it was so chill that they halted and got out their cloaks and hoods, which soon became bedewed with gray drops. Then, mounting their ponies, they went slowly on again, feeling their way by the rise and fall of the grounds. They were steering as well as they could guess, for the gate-like opening at the far northward end of the long valley, which they had seen in the morning. Once they were through the gap, they had only to keep on in anything like a straight line, and they were bound in the end to strike the road. Their thoughts did not go beyond that, except for a vague hope that perhaps away beyond the downs there might be no fog. Their going was very slow. To prevent their getting separated and wandering in different directions, they went in file. With Frodo leading, Sam was behind him, and after him came Pippin and then Merry. The valley seemed to stretch on endlessly. Suddenly, Frodo saw a hopeful sign. On either side ahead, a darkness began to loom through the mists, and he guessed that they were at last approaching the gap in the hills. The north gate of the Barrow Downs they could pass that. It would be free. Come on, follow me, he called back over his shoulder, and he hurried forward. But his hope soon changed the bewilderment and alarm. Dark patches grew darker, but they shrank, and suddenly he saw, towering ominous before him, and leaning slightly towards one another like the pillars of a headless door, two huge standing stones. He could not remember having seen any of these in the valley. And when he looked out from the hill in the morning, he had passed between them almost before he was aware. And even as he did so, darkness seemed to fall around him. His pony reared and snorted, and he fell off. When he looked back, he found that he was alone. The others had not followed him. Sam, he called. Pippin, Mary, come along. Why, do why don't you keep up? 
There was no answer. Fear took him and ran back past the stones, shouting wildly, Sam! Sam! Mary! Pippin! The pony bolted into the mist and vanished. From some way off, so it se seemed, he thought he heard a cry. Oi! Frodo! Oi! It was a way eastward on his left, as he stood under the great stones. Staring and straining into the gloom, he plunged him he plunged off in the direction of the call, and found himself going steeply uphill. As he struggled on, he called again, and kept on calling more and more frantically, but he heard no answer for some time, and then it seemed faint and far ahead, and the eye above him. Frodo, hoy! came the thin voices out of the mists, and then a cry that sounded like, Help! Help! Often repeated, and did with a last help that trailed off into a long wail, suddenly cut short. He stumbled forward with all the speed he could towards the cries, but the light was now gone, and clinging night had closed about him, so that it was impossible to be sure of any direction. He seemed all the time to be climbing up and up. Only the change in the level of, of the ground at his feet told him when he at last came to the top of a ridge or a hill. He was weary, sweating and yet chilled. It was wholly dark. Who are you? cried out miserably. There was no reply. He stood listening. He was suddenly aware that it was getting very cold, and that up here a wind was beginning to blow. An icy wind. Change was coming in the weather. The mist was, fl was flowing past him now in shreds and tatters. His breath was smoking, and the darkness was less near and thick. He looked up, saw with surprise that faint stars were appearing overhead amid the strands of hurrying cloud and fog. The wind began to hiss over the grass. He imagined suddenly that he caught a muffled cry, and he made towards it, and even as he went forward the mist was rolled up and thrust aside, and the starry sky was unveiled. A glance showed him that he was now facing southward, and was on a round hilltop, which he must have climbed from the north. Out of the east, the biting wind was blowing. To his right, there loomed against the westward stars a dark black shape. A great barrow stood there. Where are you? cried again, both angry and afraid. Here, said a voice, deep and cold, that seemed to come out of the ground. I am waiting for you. No, said Frodo, but he did not run away. His knees gave, and he fell on the ground. Nothing happened. There was no sound. Trembling, he looked up in time to see a tall, dark figure, like a shadow against the stars. It leaned over him. He thought. There were two eyes, very cold, though lit with the pale light that seemed to come from, from some remote distance. Then a grip stronger and colder than iron seized him. The icy touch froze his bones, and he remembered no more. When he came to himself again, for a moment he could recall nothing except a sense of dread. Then suddenly, he knew that he was imprisoned. Hot hopelessly, he was in a barrow. A barrow white had taken him, and was probably already under the dreadful spares, bells of the barrow whites about which whispered tales spoke. He dared not move but lay as he found himself, flat on his back, upon a cold stone with hands on his breast. Though his fear was so great that it seemed to be part of the very darkness that was round him, he found himself as he lay thinking about Bilbo Baggins and his stories, of their jogging along together in the lanes of the Shire, and talking about roads and adventures. There is a seed of courage hidden, often deeply it is true, and the heart of the fattest and most timid hobbit, waiting for some final and desperate danger to grow. Frodo was neither very fat nor very timid. Indeed, though he did not know it, Bilbo and Gandalf had thought him the best hobbit in the Shire. He thought he had come to the end of his adventure and a terrible end, but the thought hearted him. He found himself stiffening, as if for a spinal, final spring. He no longer felt limp like helpless prey. As he lay there, thinking and getting a hold of himself, he noticed all at once that a darkness was slowly giving way. 
A pale greenish light was growing round him. It did not at first show him what kind of place he was in, for the light seemed to be coming out of himself from the floor beside him, and had not yet reached the roof or wall. He turned, and there in the cold glow he saw lying beside him Sam, Pippin, and Mary. They were on their backs, and their faces looked deathly pale. They were clad in white. About them lay many treasures of gold, maybe, though in that light they looked cold and unlovely. On their heads were circlets, gold chains were about their waists, and on their fingers were many rings. Swords lay by their sides, and shields were at their feet, but across their three necks lay one long naked sword. Suddenly a song began, a cold murmur, rising and falling. The voice seemed far away and immeasurably dreary, sometimes high in the air and thin, sometimes like a low moan from the ground. Out of the formless stream of sad but horrible sounds, strings of words would now and again shape themselves, grim, hard, cold words, heartless and miserable. The night was railing against the morning, of which it was bereaved, and the cold was cursing the warmth which had covered hungered. Frodo was chilled to the marrow. After a while the song became clearer, and with dread in his heart, he perceived that it had changed into an incantation. Spoopier music. Okay, I think we're good. Cold be hand and heart and bone, and cold be sleep under stone, never more to wake on stony bed, never till the sun fails and the moon is dead. In the black wind the stars shall die, and still on gold here let them lie, till the dark lord lifts his hand over dead sea and withered land. He heard behind his head a creaking and scraping sound. Raising himself on one arm, he looked, and saw now in the pale light they were in a kind of cap of passage, which behind them turned a corner. Round the corner a long arm was groping, walking on its fingers towards Sam, who was lying nearest, towards the hilt of the sword that lay upon him. Ah, sorry. Wrong button. At first, Frodo felt as if he had indeed been turned into stone by the incantation. Then a wild thought of escape came to him. He wondered if he put on the ring, whether the Barrow White would miss him, and he might find some way out. He thought of himself running free over the grass, grieving for Merry and Sam and Pippin, but free and alive himself. Gandalf would admit that there had been and nothing else he could do. But the courage that had been awakened in him was now too strong. He could not leave his friends so easily. He wavered, groping in his pocket, and then fought with himself again. And as he did so, the arm crept nearer. Suddenly, resolve hardened in him, and he seized the short sword that lay beside him. And kneeling, he stooped low over the bodies of his companions. What strength he had... He had, he hewed at the crawling arm near the wrist, and the hand broke off. At the same moment, the sword splintered up to the hilt, 
there was a shriek, the light vanished, in the dark there was a snarling noise. Frodo fell forward over Mary. Mary's face felt cold, all at once back into his mind, from which it had disappeared with the first coming of the fog, came the memory of the house down under the hill, and of Tom singing. He remembered the rhyme that Tom had taught them. In a small, desperate voice, he began, Oh, Tom Bombadil. With that name, his voice seemed to grow strong. It had a full and lively sound, and the dark chamber echoed as if to drum and trumpet. Oh, Tom Bombadil, Tom Bombadillo. By water, wood, and hill, by the reed and willow, by fire, sun, and moon, hearken now and hear us. Come, Tom Bombadil, for our need is near us. There was a sudden deep silence in which Frodo could hear his heart beating. After a long, slow moment, he heard plain but far away, as if it was coming down through the ground or through thick walls, an answering voice singing, Old Tom Bombadil is a merry fellow, bright blue his jacket is, and his boots are yellow. None has ever caught him yet, for Tom he is the master. His songs are stronger songs, and his feet are faster. There was a loud rumbling sound as of stones rolling and falling, and suddenly light streamed in, real light, the plain light of day. A low door-like opening appeared at the end of the chamber beyond Frodo's feet. There was Tom's head, hat, feather and all, framed against the light of the sun rising red behind him. The light fell upon the door and upon the faces of the three hobbits lying beside Frodo. They did not stir but the sickly hue had left them. They looked now as if they were only very deep asleep. Tom stooped, removed his hat, and came into the dark chamber, seeing, Get out, you old white! Vanish in the sunlight! Shiver like the cold mist, like the winds go wailing! Out into the barren lands, far beyond the mountains! Come here, never here again! Leave your barrow empty! Lost and forgotten be, darker than the darkness! where gates stand forever shut, till the world is mended. At these words, there was a cry in part of the inner end of the chamber, fell in with a crash. There was a long trailing shriek, fading away and into an unguessable distance, and after that, silence. Come, friend Frodo, said Tom, let's bear out to clean grass. You must help me bear them. Together they carried out Mary, Pippin, and Sam. As Frodo left the barrow for the last time, he thought he saw a severed hand wriggling still like a wounded spider in a heap of fallen earth. Tom went back in again, and there was a sound of much thumping and stamping. When he came out, he was bearing in his arms a great load of treasure, things of gold, silver, copper, and bronze, many beads and chains and jeweled ornaments. He climbed the green barrow and laid them all on top in the sunshine. Up, oh, back to happy music now. Go. Wake now, my merry lads. Wake and hear me calling. Warm now be heart and limb. The cold stone is fallen. Dark door is standing wide. Dead hand is broken. Night under night is flown and the gate is open. To Frodo's great joy, the hobbits stirred, stretched their arms, rubbed their eyes, then suddenly sprang up. They looked about in amazement, first at Frodo, then at Tom, standing large as life on the barrow top above them, and then at themselves, in their thin white rags, crowned and belted with pale gold and jingling with trinkets. What in the name of wonder? began Mary, feeling the gold circlet that had, had slipped over that had been slipped over one eye. Then he stopped, and a shadow came over his face, and closed his, his eyes. Of course I remember, he said. The men of Karn Doom came, came on us at night, and we were worsted. I have the spear in my heart. He clutched at his breast. No, no, he said, opening his eyes. What am I saying? I've been dreaming. Where did you get to, Frodo? I thought that I was lost, said Frodo, but I didn't want to speak of it. Let us think of what we are to do now. Let us go on. Just like this, sir, said Sam. Where are my clothes? He flung his circlet, belt, and rings on the grass and looked around helplessly. 
as if expecting to find his cloak, jacket, and breeches, and other hobbit garments lying somewhere at a hand. You won't find your clothes again, said Tom, bounding down from the mound and laughing as he danced around them in the sunlight. One would have thought that nothing dangerous or dreadful had happened. Indeed, the horror faded out of their hearts as they looked at him and saw the merry glint in their eyes. What do you mean? asked Pip Pippin, looked at him half puzzled and half amused. Why not? But Tom shook his head, saying, You found yourselves again out of the deep water. Clothes are but little loss. If you escape from drowning, be glad, my merry friends, and let the warm sunlight heart now the warm sunlight heat now heart and limb. Cast off these cold rags, run naked on the grass, while Tom goes a hunting. He sprang away downhill, whistling and calling. Looking down after him, Frodo saw him running away southwards along the green hollow between their hill and the next, still whistling and crying. Hey now, ho now! Whither do you wander? Up, down, near, or far, here, there, or yonder? Sharp ears, wise nose, swish tail, and bumpkin. White socks, my little lad, and old fatty lumpkin. Though he sang, running fast, tossing up his hat and catching it, until he was hidden by a fold of the ground. But for some time his hey now, ho now, came floating back down the wind, which had shifted round towards the south. The air was growing very warm again. The hobbits ran about for a while on the grass as he told them. Then they lay basking in the sun with the delight, those that had been wafted suddenly from bitter winter to a friendly clime, or a people that, after being long ill and bedridden, make one day to find that they are unexpectedly well, and the day is again full of promise. By the time that Tom returned, they were feeling strong and hungry. He reappeared hat first over the brow of the hill, and behind him came in obedience. Line six ponies, their own five and one more. The last was plainly pla was plainly old Fatty Lumpkin. He was larger, stronger, fatter, and older than their own ponies. Mary, to whom the others belonged, had not, in fact, given them any such names. But they answered to the new names that Tom had given them for the rest of their lives. Tom called them one by one, and they climbed over the brow and stood in line. Then Tom bowed the hobbits. Where are your ponies now, he said. They've more sense, in some ways, than you wandering hobbits have. More sense in their noses. But they sniff danger ahead, which you walk right into. And if they run to save themselves, then they run the right way. You must forgive them all. For though their hearts are faithful, to face fear of Barrow Whites is not what they were made for. See, here they come again, bringing all their burdens. Mary, Sam, and Pippin now clothed themselves in spare garments from their packs. And they soon felt too hot, for they were obliged to put on some of the thicker and warmer things that they had brought against the oncoming of winter. Where does, where does that other old animal, that fatty lumpkin, come from? Asked Frodo. He's mine, said Tom, my four-legged friend. I seldom ride him, and he wanders often far free upon the hillsides. When your pony, pony stayed with me, they got to know my lumpkin. They smelt him in the night, and quickly ran to meet him. I thought he'd look for them, and with his words of wisdom, take all their fear away. But now, my jolly lumpkin, old Tom's going to ride, hey. He's coming with you, just to set you on the road. So, so he needs a pony. You cannot easily talk to hobbits that are riding, for when you're on your own legs trying to trot beside them. The hobbits were delighted to hear this, thanked Tom many times. But he laughed and said that they were so good at losing themselves that he would not feel, feel happy till he had seen them safe for the borders of this land. I've got things to do, he said. My making and my seeing, my talking and my walking, my watching of the country. Tom can't be always near to open doors and willow cracks. Tom has his mouse to, has house to mind and Goldberry is waiting. It was still fairly early by the sun. Something something between nine and ten, and the hobbits turned their minds to food. Their last meal had been lunch beside the standing stone the day before. They breakfasted now off the remainder of Tom's provisions, meant for their supper, with additions that Tom had brought with him. It was not a large meal, considering hobbits and the circumstances, but they felt much better for it. While they were eating, 
Tom went up to the mound and looked through the treasures. Most of, the, of these he made into a pile that glistered and sparkled on the grass. He bade them lie there, free to all finders, birds, beasts, elves or men, and all kindly creatures. For so the spell of the mound should be broken and scattered, no white ever come back to it. He chose for himself from the pile a brooch set with blue stones, many shaded like flax flowers or the wings of blue butterflies. He looked at it as if stirred by some memory, shaking his head and saying at last, Here's a pretty toy for Tom and, his, and for his lady. Fair was she who long ago wore this on her shoulder. Old Barry shall wear it now. We will not forget her. For each of the hobbits, he chose a dagger, long, leaf-shaped and keen, of marvelous workmanship, damask with serpent forms in red and gold. They gleamed as he drew them from their black sheaths, wrought of some strange metal, light and strong, and set with many fiery stones. Whether by some virtue in these sheaths, or because of the spell that lay on the mound, the blades seemed untouched by time, unrusted, sharp, glittering in the sun. Old knives are long enough as swords for hobbit people, he said. Sharp blades are good to have. Shire folk, if shire folk go walking, east, south, they're far away into dark and danger. Then he told them that these blades were forged many long years ago by, by men of Westerness. They were foes of the Dark Lord, but they were overcome by the evil king of Karn Doom in the land of Angmar. You now remember them, Tom murmured. Yet still some go wandering, sons of forgotten kings walking in loneliness, guarding from evil things folk that are heedless. The hobbits did not understand his words, but as he spoke, they had a vision as it, as it were of a great expanse of years behind them, like a vast shadowy plain over which there strode shapes of men, tall and grim with bright swords, and last came one with with a star on his brow. Then the vision faded, and they were back in the sunlit world. It was time to start again. They made ready, packing their bags and lading their ponies. Their new weapons they hung on their leather belts under their jackets, feeling them very awkward and wondering if they would be of any use. Fighting had not before occurred to any of them as one of the adventures in which their flight would land them. At last they set off, they led their ponies down to the hill, and then mounting, they trotted quickly along the, the valley. They looked back and saw the top of the old mound on the hill, and from it, the sunlight on the gold went up like a yellow flame. Then they turned a shoulder of the downs, and it was hidden from view. Though Frodo looked about him on every side, he saw no sign of the great stones standing like a gate. Before long, they came to the northern gap and rode swiftly through, and the land fell away before them. It was a merry journey with Tom Bombadil trot in gaily beside them or before them, on Fatty Lumpkin, who could move much faster than his girth promised. Tom sang most of the time, but it was chiefly nonsense, or else perhaps a strained language unknown to the hobbits, an ancient language whose words were mainly those of wonder and delight. They went forward steadily, but they soon saw that the road was farther away than they had imagined. Even without a fog, their sleep at midday would have prevented them from reaching it until after nightfall on the day before. The dark line they had seen was not a line of trees, but a line of bushes growing on the edges of a deep dike with, with a steep wall on the further side. Tom said that it had once been the boundary of a kingdom, but a very long time ago, he seemed to remember something sad about it, but would not say much. They climbed down and out of the dike and through a gap in the wall. And then Tom turned due north, for they had been bearing somewhat to the west. The land was now open and fairly level, and they quickened their pace. But the sun was already sinking low, and at last they saw a line of tall trees ahead, and they knew that they had come back to the road after many unexpected adventures. They galloped their ponies over the last furlongs and halted under the long shadows of the trees. They were on the top of a sloping bank, and the road, now dim as evening drew on, wound away below them. At this point, it ran nearly from southwest to northeast. 
and on their right, it fell quickly down into a wide hollow. It was rutted and bore many signs of recent heavy rain. There were pools and potholes full of water. They rode down the bank and looked up and down. There was nothing to be seen. Well, here we are again at last, said Frodo. I suppose we haven't lost more than two days by my shortcut through the forest. But perhaps the delay will prove useful. It may have put them off our trail. The others looked at him. The shadow of the fear of the Black Riders came suddenly over them again. Ever since they had entered the forest, they had thought chiefly of getting back to the road. Only now, when it lay beneath their feet, did they remember the danger which pursued them. It was more than likely to be lying in wait for them upon the road itself. They looked anxiously back towards the setting sun, but the road was brown and empty. Do you think? Asked Pippin hesitantly. Do you think we may be pursued tonight? No, I hope not, answered Tom Bombadil, or perhaps the next day. But do not trust my guess, for I cannot tell for certain. Out east my knowledge fails. Tom is not master of riders from the black land far beyond his country. All the same, the hobbits wished he was coming with them. They felt that he would know how to deal with black riders, if anyone did. They would soon now be going forward into lands wholly strange to them, and beyond all but the most vague and distant legends of the Shire. And in the gathering twilight, they longed for home. A deep loneliness and sense of loss was on them. They stood re silent, reluctant to make the final parting, and only slowly became aware that Tom was wishing them farewell, and telling them to have good heart, and to ride on till dark without halting. Tom will give you good advice, till this day is over. After that, your own luck must go with you and guide you, Four miles along the road, you'll come upon a village, Bree under Bree Hill, with doors looking westward. There you'll find an old inn that is called the Prancing Pony. Parliament Butterbur is the worthy keeper. There you can stay the night, and afterwards the morning will speed you upon your way. Be bold but wary. Keep up your merry hearts, and ride to meet your fortune. They begged him to come at, at least as far as the inn, and drink once more of them, but he laughed and refusing. Tom's country ends here. He will not pass the borders. Tom has his house to mind. Goldberry is waiting. Then he turned, tossed up his hat, leaped on Lumpkin's back, and rode over the bank and away singing into the dusk. The hobbits climbed up and watched him until he was out of sight. I'm sorry to take leave of Master Bombadil, said Sam. He's a good and, and no mistake. I reckon... We may go a good deal further and see not better nor queer, but I won't deny. I'll be glad to see this prince and pony he spoke of. I hope it'll be like the dr green dragon away back home. What sort of fork folks are there in Bree? Oh, I've got two fluid checks and a leg day. Hi, Avia. Thank you for coming by. I hope you're doing okay. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Doing good just working on art oh that's cool hmm could probably make an art channel and score it if people want to sh if they have anything they want to share or just like creative projects or something like that whether it's art or music or something that would be Need to take another good. Got two fluid. Let's see, there are hobbits in Bree," said Mary, "as well as big folk. I dare say it will be homelike enough. The pony is a good inn by all accounts. My pi my people ride out there, there now again and again." It may be, it may be well all we could wish," said Frodo. 
but it is outside the Shire all the same. Make yourselves too much at home. Please remember all of you that the name of Baggins must not be mentioned. I am Underhill, if any name must be given. They now mounted their ponies and rode off silently into the evening. Darkness came down quickly. They plodded slowly downhill and up again, until at last they saw lights twinkling some distance ahead. Before them rose Bree Hill barring the way, a dark mass against misty stars, and under its western flank nestled a large village. Towards it, they now hurried, desiring only to find a fire and door between them and the night. And we finished chapter 8. Oh my gosh, we are moving at lightning speed tonight, folks. Oh my gosh. Because chapter 9 is, is called At the Sign of the Prancing Pony. I get to bust out the tavern tracks I have. Nice. Here to listen to the Cozy Lord's Rings audiobook. Aw. I hope you enjoy it, Jenny. Thank you so much for coming by. I hope you're doing well. And I hope you have a nice, uh, have a nice cozy time enjoying the rest of this. Happy I get to pop out my, um, a tavern trek. Finally. Too many options. Uh, but, but, but I was. That went on his Freddy. Ooh. This one looks good. Oh yeah, here we go. Just had lunch, hope you're having a good- Oh yeah, I'm doing good, thank you. Hmm. Let's see, okay, so chapter nine. The sign of the prancing pony. Bree was the chief village of the Bree land. A small inhabited region, like an island in the empty lands round about. Besides Bree itself, there was Staddle on the other side of the hill. Combe in a deep valley a little further eastward, and arch it on the edge of the Chetwood. Lying round Bree Hill on the villages was a small country of fields and tamed woodland, only a few miles abroad. The men of Bree were brown-haired, broad and rather short, cheerful and independent. They belonged to nobody but themselves. But they were more friendly and familiar with hobbits, dwarves, elves, and other inhabitants of the world about them than was or is usual with big people. According to their own tales, they were the original inhabitants and were descendants of the first men that ever wandered into the west of the Middle World. You had survived the turmoils of the Elder Days when the kings returned again over the Great Sea. They had found the Bremen still there, but they were still there now when the memory of the old kings had faded into the grass. In those days, no other men had settled dwellings so far west or within a hundred leagues of the Shire. But in the wild lands beyond Bree, there were mysterious wanderers. The Bree folk called them rangers and knew nothing of their origin. They were taller and darker than the men of Bree and were believed to have strange powers of sight and hearing and to understand the languages of beasts and birds. They roamed at will southwards and eastwards, even as far as the Misty Mountains. But they were now few and rarely seen. When they appeared, they brought news from afar and told strange forgotten tales which were eagerly listened to, but the Bree folk did not make friends of them. There were also many families of Hobbit in the Bree Land, and they claimed to be the oldest settlement of Hobbits in the world, one that was founded long before even the Brandywine was crossed and the Shire colonized. They live mostly in Staddle, 
though there were some in the brie itself, especially on the higher slopes of the hill, above the houses of the men. The big folk and the little folk, as they called one another, were on friendly terms, minding their own affairs in their own ways, but both rightly regarding themselves as necessary parts of the brie folk. Nowhere else in the world was this peculiar but excellent arrangement to be found. The brie folk, big and little, did not themselves travel much, and the affairs of the four villagers, villages were their chief concern. Occasionally the hobbits of Bree went as far as Buckland or the East Farthing, but though their, their little land was not much farther than a day's riding east of the Brandywine Bridge, the hobbits of the Shire now seldom visited it. An occasional Bucklander or adventurous took would come over out to the inn for a night or two, but even that was becoming less and less usual. The Shire Hobbits referred to those of Bree and to any others that lived beyond the borders as outsiders and took very little interest in them, considering them dull and uncouth. There were probably many more outsiders scattered about in the west of the world in those days than the people of the Shire imagined. Some doubtless were no better than tramps, ready to dig a hole in any bank stay only as long as it suited them, but in the Bree land, at any rate, the Hobbits were decent and prosperous and no more rustic than most of their distant relatives inside. It was not yet forgotten that there had been a time. There was much coming and going between the Shire and Bree. There was Bree blood in the Brandy Bucks by all accounts. The village of Bree had some hundred stone houses of the big folk, mostly above the road, nestling on the hillside with windows looking west. On that side, running in more than half a circle from the hill and back to it, there was a deep dike with a thick hedge on the inner side. Over this, the road crossed by a causeway, but where it pierced the hedge, it was barred by a great gate. There was another gate in the southern corner where the road ran out of the village. The gates were closed at nightfall, but just inside them were small lodges for the gatekeepers. Down on the road where it swept to, to the right to go round the foot of the hill, there was a large inn. It had been built long ago when the traffic on the roads had been far greater, for Bree stood at an old meaning of ways. Another ancient road crossed the east road just outside the dike at the western end of the village. In the former days men and other folks of various sorts had traveled much on it. Strange as news from Bree was still a saying in the east farthing, descending from those days when news from north, south, and east could be heard in the inn and when the Shire Hobbits used to go more often to hear it. But the northern lands had long been desolate, and the northern road was now seldom used. It was grass-grown, and the Bree folk called it the Greenway. The Inn of Bree was still there, however, and the innkeeper was an important person. His house was a meeting place for the idle, talkative, and inquisitive among the inhabitants, large and small, of the four villages, and a resort of rangers and other wanderers, and for such travelers, mostly dwarves, as still journey to the east road to and from the mountains. It was dark, and white stars were shining, when Frodo and his companions came at last to the Greenway Crossing and drew near the village. They came to the west gate and found it shut, but the door at the lodge beyond it there was a man sitting. He jumped up and fetched a lantern, and looked over the gate at them in surprise. What do you want, and where do you come from? He asked gruffly. We are making for the inn here, answered Frodo. We are journeying east and cannot go further tonight. Hobbits? Four hobbits? It's more out of the Shire by their talk, said the gatekeeper, softling as if speaking to himself. He stared at them darkly for a moment, and then slowly opened the gate and let them ride through. Don't often see Shire folk riding on the road at night, he went on, and as they halted a moment by his door. Pardon my wandering, what business takes you away east of Bree? May your names be, might I ask? Our names and our business are our own, and this does not seem a good place to discuss them, said Frodo, not liking the look of the man or the tone in his voice. Your business is your own, no doubt, said the man, but it's my business to ask questions after nightfall. We are hobbits from we are hobbits from Buckland, and we have a fancy to travel and to stay at the inn here, put in Mary. I am Mr. Brandybuck. Is that enough for you? 
The Bree folk used to be fair spoken tr to travelers, or so I had heard. All right, all right, said the man. I meant no offense. You'll find maybe that more folk than old Harry at the gate will be asking you questions. There's queer folk about. Go on to the pony. You'll find you're not the only guests. He wished them good night, and they said no more. But Frodo could see in the lantern light that the man was still eyeing them curiously. He was glad to hear the gate clang to behind them as they rode forward. He wondered why the man was so suspicious, and whether anyone had been asking for news of a party of hobbits. Could it have been Gandalf? He might have arrived while they were delayed in the forest and the downs. But there was something in the look and the voice of the gatekeeper that made him uneasy. The man stared after the hobbits for a moment, and then he went back to his house. As soon as his back was turned, a dark figure climbed quickly in over the gate, melted into the shadows of the village street. The hobbits rode, rode on up a gentle slope, passing a few detached houses, and drew up outside the inn. The houses looked large and strange to them. Sam stared up at the inn with its three, three stories and many windows, and felt his heart sink. He had imagined himself meeting giants taller than trees, and other creatures even more terrifying some time or other in the course of his journey, but at that moment, he was finding his first sight of men in their tall houses quite enough, indeed, too much for the dark end of a tiring day. He pictured black horses standing all saddled in the shadows of the inn yard, and black riders peering out of the dark upper windows. We surely aren't going to stay here for the night, are we, sir? exclaimed. If there are hobbit folk in these parts, why don't we look for some that would be willing to take us in? It would seem more homelike. What's wrong with the inn? said Frodo. Tom Bombadil recommended it. I expect it's homelike enough inside. Even from the outside, the inn looked a pleasant house to familiar eyes. It had a front on, on the road, and two wings running back on the land partly cut out of the lower slopes of the hill. So that at the rear... The second floor windows were level with the ground. There was a wide arch leading to a courtyard between the two wings, and on the left under the arch there was a large doorway reached by a few broad steps. The door was open, and light streamed out of it. Above the arch there was a lamp, and beneath it swung a large signboard. A fat white pony reared up on its hind legs. Over the door was painted in white letters, Prancing Pony by Barlamen Butterfer. Any of the lower windows sh showed lights behind thick curtains. As they headed, hesitated outside in the gloom, someone began singing a merry song inside, and many cheerful voices joined loudly in the chorus. They listened to this encouraging sound for a moment, then got off their ponies. The song ended and there was a, a burst of laughter and clapping. They led their ponies under the arch, and leaving them, as, and leaving them standing in the yard, they climbed up the steps. Frodo went forward and nearly bumped into a short fat man with a bald head and a red face. He had a white apron on and was bustling out of one door and in through another, carrying a tray laden with full mugs. Can we? began Frodo. Have a minute if you please, shouted the man over his shoulder, vanished into a babble of voices and a cloud of smoke. In a moment, he was out again, wiping his hands on his apron. Good evening, little masters, he said, bending down. What may you be wanting? Uh, beds for four, and stabling for five ponies, if that can be managed. Are you Mr. Butterbur? That's right. Barlaman is my name. Barlaman Butterbur, at your service. You're from the Shire, eh? He said, and then suddenly he clapped his hand to his forehead, as if trying to remember something. Hobbits, he cried. Now what does that remind me of? Might I ask your name, sir? Uh, Mr. Took and Mr. Brandybuck, said Frodo. And this is Sam Ganji. My name is Underhill. There now, said Mr. Butterbur, snapping his fingers. It's gone again. It'll come back. My, it'll come back when I have time to think. I'm, I'm run off my feet. But I'll see what I can do for you. Don't often get a party out of the Shire nowadays. I should be sorry not to make you welcome. But there is such a crowd already in the house tonight as there hasn't been for long enough. Never rains, but it pours, as we say in Bree. Hi, Nob, he shouted. Where are you, you woolly footed slow coach, Nob? Coming, sir, coming, sir. A cheery looking hobbit popped. 
bobbed out of a door, and seeing the traveler had stopped short and stared at them with great interest. Where's Bob? asked the landlord. I don't know. We'll go find him. Double sharp. I haven't got six legs, nor six eyes, neither. Tell Bob there's five ponies that have to be stabled. You must find room somehow. Knob trotted off with a grin and a wink. Oh no, what was I going to say? said Mr. Butterbur, tapping his forehead. One thing drives in another, so to speak. I'm that busy tonight, my head is going round. There's a party that come up the Greenway from down south last night. That was strange enough to begin with. Then there's a traveling company of dwarves going west come in this evening. Now there's you. You weren't hobbits. I doubt if we could house you. But we've got a room or two in the north wings that were made special for hobbits when this place was built. The ground floor as they usually prefer. Round windows and all as they like it. I hope you'll be comfortable. You'll be wanting supper, I don't doubt, as soon as you, as soon as may be. This way now. He led them a short way down a passage and opened a door. Here is a nice little parlor, he said. We put suit. I hope it will suit. Excuse me now. I'm that busy. Time for talking. I must be trotting. It's hard work for two legs. But I don't get thinner. I'll look in again later. If you want anything, ring the handbell and Nob will come. If you don't come, ring and shout. Off he went at last and left them feeling rather breathless. He seemed capable of an endless stream of talk, however busy he might be. They found themselves in a small and cozy room. There was a bit of bright fire burning on the hearth, and in front of them were some low and comfortable chairs. There was a round table, already spread with a white cloth, and on it was a large handbell. But Nob, the hobbit servant, came bustling in long before they thought of ringing. He brought candles and a tray full of plates. Will you be wanting anything to drink, masters? He asked. Shall I show you the bedrooms while your supper is got ready? They were washed and in the middle of a good deep mugs of beer when Mr. Butterbur and Nob came in again. In a twinkling, the table was laid. There was hot soup, cold meats, a blackberry tart, new loaves, slabs of butter, and half a ripe cheese. Good plain food as good as the Shire could show, and homelike enough to dispel the last of Sam's misgivings, already much relieved by the excellence of the beer. The landlord ho hovered around for a little, and then prepared to leave them. I don't know whether you would care to join the company when you have supped, he said, standing at the door. Perhaps you would rather go to your beds. Still, the company would be very pleased to welcome you. If you had a mind, we don't get outsiders. Travelings from, travelers from the Shire, I should say, begging your pardon. Often, and we'd like to hear a bit of news, or any story or song you may have, have in mind. But as you please, ring the bell if you lack anything. They were refreshed and encouraged they did feel at the end of their supper. About three quarters of an hour steady going, not hindered by unnecessary talk, that Frodo, Pippin, and Sam decided to join the company. Mary said it would be too stuffy. I shall sit here quietly by the fire for a bit. Perhaps go out later for a sniff of the air. Mind your P's and Q's and don't forget that you are supposed to be escaping in secret. And are still on the high road and not very far from the Shire. All right, said Pippin. Mind yourself, don't get lost. Don't forget that it is safer indoors. The company was in big commotion, was in the big common room of the inn. The gathering was large and mixed, as Frodo discovered, when his eyes got used to the light. This came chiefly from a blazing log fire, for the three lamps hanging from the beams were dim and half veiled in smoke. Barlam and Butterbeer was. But. Blah, blah, blah. Barlam and Butterbur was standing near the fire, talking to a couple of dwarves. And no. And one or two strange looking men. On the benches were various folk, men of Bree, a collection of local hobbits, hobbits, sitting chattering together, a few more dwarves, and other vague figures difficult to make out away in the shadows and corners. As soon as the Shire hobbits entered, there was a chorus of welcome from the Bree landers. The strangers, especially those that had come up the greenway, stared at them curiously. The landlord introduced the newcomers to the Bree folk so quickly, though they caught many names. They were seldom sure who the names belonged to. The men of Bree seemed all to have rather botanical, to the Shire folk rather odd names, like Rushlight, Goatleaf, Heathertoes, Appledore, Thistlewool, and Fernie, not to mention Butterbur. Some of the hobbits had sim similar names. The Mugworts, for, for instance, seemed numerous, but most of them had natural names, such as Banks, 
rock houses, long holes, sand heaver, and tun tunnelly, many of which were used in the Shire. There were several underhills from Saddle, and as though they could not imagine sharing a name without being related, they took Frodo to their hearts as a long-lost cousin. Okay, there. Music didn't repeat for some reason. Gone to a different track. The three hobbits were, in fact, friendly and inquisitive, and Frodo soon found that some explanation of what he was doing would have would have to be given. He gave out that he was interested in history and geography, at which there was much wagging of heads, although neither of these words were much used in the Bree dialect. He said he was thinking of writing a book, to which there was silent astonishment, and that he and his friends wanted to collect information about hobbits living outside the Shire, especially in the eastern lands. At this, a chorus of voices broke out. If Frodo had really wanted to write a book and had many ears, he would have learned enough for several chapters in a few minutes. If that wasn't enough, he was given a whole list of names, beginning with Old Barlaman here, to whom he could go for further information. But after a time, as Frodo did not show any sign of writing a book on the spot, the hobbits returned to their questions about doings in the Shire. Frodo did not prove very communica communicative, and he soon found himself sitting alone in a corner, listening and looking around. The men and dwarves were mostly talking of some of distant events, and telling news of a kind that was becoming only too familiar. There was trouble away in the south. It seemed that the men who had come up the Greenway were on the move, looking for lands where they could find some peace. The Bree folk were sympathetic, but plainly not very ready to take a large number of strangers in their little land. One of the travelers, a squint-eyed, ill-favored fellow, was foretelling that many and more people would be coming north in the near future. Room isn't to be found isn't found for them. They'll find it for themselves. They've a right to live, same as other folks, he said loudly. Local inhabitants did not look pleased at the prospect. The hobbits did not pay much attention to all this, as it did not at the moment seem to concern hobbits. Big folk could hardly beg for lodging in hobbit holes. They were more interested in Sam and Pippin, who were now feeling quite at home, and were chatting gaily about events in the Shire. Pippin roused a good deal of laughter with an account of the collapse of the roof of the town hall in Mitchell Delving. Will Whitfoot, the mare, and the fattest hobbit in the West Farthing had been buried in chalk and came out like a flowered dumpling. But there were several questions that asked that made Frodo a little uneasy. One of the Breelanders, who seemed to have been in the Shire several times, wanted to know where the Underhills lived and who they were related to. Suddenly, Frodo noticed that a strange-looking weather-beaten man, sitting in the shadows near the hall, near the wall, was also listening intently to the hobbit talk. He had a long tankard in front of him, and was smoking a long stem pipe curiously carved. His legs were stretched out before him, showing high boots of supple leather that fitted him well, but had seen much wear and were now caked with mud. A travel-stained cloak of heavy dark green cloth was drawn close about him, in spite of the heat of the room, he wore a hood that overshadowed his face, that the gleam of his eyes could be seen as he watched the hobbits. Who is that? Frodo asked when he got a chance to whisper to Mustard Butterbur. I don't think you introduced him. Him? said the landlord in an answering whisper, talking an eye without turning his head. I don't rightly know. He's one of them wandering folks. Rangers, we call them. He seldom talks. Not, but we can tell... Not but what he can tell a rare tale when he has the mind. He disappears for a month or a year, and then he pops up again. He was in and out pretty, pretty often last spring, but I haven't seen him about lately. It's his right name, as I've never heard him. But he's known round here as Strider. Goes about at a great pace on his long shanks. Though we don't tell, tell nobody what causes he has to hurry, but there's no accounting for east and west, as we say in Bree. 
meaning the rangers and the Shire folk begged your pardon. Funny you should ask about him. At that moment, Mr. Burdifer was called away by a demand for more ale, and his last remark remained unexplained. Berto found that Strider was now looking at him, as if he had heard or guessed all that had been said. Presently, with a wave of his hand and a nod, he invited Frodo to come over and sit by him. As Frodo near drew near, he threw back his hood, showing a shaggy head of dark hair flecked with gray, and in a pale, stern face, a pair of keen gray eyes. Decide on a voice. It's, it's, but we know who. We know who it is. Oh my gosh. Um. I'm called Strider. He said in a voice. I'm very pleased to meet you, Master Underhill. If old Butterbeer got your name right. He, he did. Said Frodo stiffly. He felt far from comfortable under the stare of those keen eyes. Well, Mister Underhill said Strider. If I were you, I should stop talking. Stop your young friends from talking too much. Drink, fire, and chance meetings are pleasant enough, but, well, this isn't the Shire. There are queer folk about. Though I say it as shouldn't, you might, may think. He had with a wry smile, seeing Frodo's glance. And there have been ever stranger travelers through Bree lately. He went on, watching Frodo's fells. Face. Frodo returned his gaze, but said nothing. And Strider made no further sign. His attentions seemed suddenly to be fixed on Pippin. To his alarm, Frodo became aware that the ridiculous young Took, encouraged by his success with the fat mare of Joe Delving, was now actually giving a comedic account of Bilbo's farewell party. Oh, thank you for the fluid check. He was already giving an imitation of the speech and was drawing near to the astonishing disappearance. Frodo was annoyed. It was a harmless enough tale for most of the local hobbits, no doubt. Just a funny story that those funny people away beyond the river, but some old, but some old Butterbur, for instance, knew a thing or two, and had probably heard, heard rumors long ago about Bilbo's vanishing. It would bring the name of Baggins to their minds, especially if there had been inquiries in Bree after that name. Frodo fidgeted, wondering what to do. Pippin was evidently much enjoying the attention he was getting, and become quite forgetful of the danger. Frodo had a sudden fear that in his present mood, he might even mention the ring, and that might well be disastrous. You had better do something quick, whispered Strider in his ear. Frodo jumped up and stood on a table and began to talk. The attention of Pippin's audience was disturbed. Some of the hobbits looked at Frodo and laughed and clapped, thinking that Mr. Underhill had taken as much ale as was good for him. Frodo suddenly felt very foolish and found himself, as was his habit when making a speech, fingering the things in his pocket. He felt the ring on his chain, and quite unaccountably the desire came over to slip it on and vanish out of the silly situation. It seemed to him somehow as if the suggestion came to him from outside, from someone or something in the room. He resisted the temptation firmly, and clasped the ring in his hand as if to keep a hold on it and to prevent it from escaping or doing any mischief. At any rate, it gave him no inspiration. He spoke a few suitable words, as they would have said in the Shire. We're all very much grateful, gratified by the kindness of your reception, and I venture to hope that my brief visit will help to renew the old ties of friendship between the Shire and Bree. And then he hesitated and coughed. Everyone in the room was now looking at him. A song, shouted one of the hobbits. A song, a song, and all the others. Come on now, Master, sing us something that we haven't heard before. For a moment, Frodo stood gaping. Then in desperation, he began a ridiculous song that Bilbo had been rather fond of, and indeed rather proud of, for he had made up the words himself. It was about an inn, and that is probably why it came to Frodo's mind just then. Here it is in full. Only a few words of it are now, as a rule, remembered. There is an inn, a merry old inn, beneath an old grey hill. And there were, and there they brew a beer so brown that the man in the moon himself came down one night to drink his fill. The ostler has a tipsy cat that plays a five-string fiddle. And up and down he runs his bow, now squeaking high, now purring low, now sawing in the middle. The landlord keeps a little dog that is mighty fond of jokes. 
when there's good cheer among the guests. He cocks an ear at all the jests and laughs until he chokes. They also keep a horned cow as proud as any queen, but music turns her head like ale and makes her wave her tough tail and dance upon the green. And oh, the rows of silver dishes and the store of silver spoons. For Sunday, there's a special pair, and these they polish up with care on su su Saturday afternoons. The man in the moon was drinking deep, and the cat began to wail. A dish and a spoon on the table pranced, on the table danced. The cow in the garden madly pranced, and the little dog chased his tail. The man in the moon took another mug, and then rolled beneath his chair. And there he dozed and dreamed of ale, till in the sky the stars were pale, and dawn was in the air. Then the ostler said to his tipsy cat, the white horses of the moon, they neigh and champ their silver bits, but their master's been and drowned his wits, and the sun'll be rising soon. So the cat on his fiddle played hey diddle diddle, a jig that would wake the dead. He squeaked and sawed and quickened the tune, while the landlord shook the man in the moon. It's after three, he said. They rolled the man slowly up the hill and bundled him into the moon, while his horses galloped up in the rear, and the cow came capering like a deer and a dish ran up with a spoon. Now quicker the fiddle went deedle, deedle dum diddle the dog began to roar. The cow and the horses stood on their heads. The, gu the guests all bounded from their beds and danced upon the floor. With a ping and a pong, the fiddle strings broke. The, cr the cow jumped over the moon, and the little dog laughed to see such fun, and the Saturday dish went off at a run with the silver Sunday spoon. The round moon, the round moon rolled behind the hill, as the sun raised up her head, she hardly believed her fiery eyes, for though it was day, to her surprise, they all went back to bed. There was a loud and long applause. Frodo had a good voice, and the song tickled their ears. Where's old Barley? they cried. He ought to hear this. Bob ought to learn his to learn his cat the fiddle, and then we'd have a dance. They called for more ale and began to shout, Let's have it again, master. Come on now, once more. They made Frodo have another drink. And then began his song again, while many of them joined in, for the tune was well known, and they were quick at picking up words. It was now Frodo's turn to feel pleased with himself. He capered about on the table, and when he came a second time to the cow jumped over the moon, he leapt in the air, much too vigorously, for he came down, bang, into a tray full of mugs, and, and slipped and rolled off the table with a crash, clatter, and bumper. The audience all opened their mouths wide for laughter, and stopped, sh stopped short in gaping silence. For the singer disappeared. He simply vanished, as if he had gone slap through the floor without, without leaving a hole. The local hobbit stared in amazement, and then sprang to their feet and shouted for Barlamin. All the company drew away from Pippin and Sam, who found themselves left alone in a corner, and eyed darkly and doubtfully from a distance. It was plain that many people regarded them now as the companions of a traveling magician of unknown powers and purpose. But there was one swarthy Brelander, who stood looking at them with a knowing and half-mocking expression that made them feel very uncomfortable. Presently, he slipped out of the door, followed by the, by the squint-eyed southerner. The two had been whispering together a good deal during the evening. Frodo felt a fool. Not knowing what else to do, he crawled away under the tables to the dark corner by Strider, who sat unmoved, giving no sign of his thoughts. Frodo leaned back against the wall and took off the ring. How it came to be on his finger, he could not tell. He could only suppose that he had been handling it in his pocket while he sang, and that somehow it slipped on when he stuck out his hand with a jerk to save his fall. For a moment, he wondered if the ring itself had not played him a trick. Perhaps it had tried to reveal itself in response to some wish or command that was felt in the room. He did not like the looks of the men that had gone out. Well, said Strider when he reappeared, why did you do that? Or than anything your friends could have said. You put your foot in it. Or should I say your finger? I, I I don't know what you mean, said Frodo, annoyed and alarmed. Oh, yes, you do, answered Strider. But we had better wait until the uproar has died down. Then if you please, Mr. Baggins, I should like a quiet word with you. What about? asked Frodo, ignoring the sudden use of his proper name. A matter of some importance to us both, answered Strider, looking Frodo in the eye. You may hear something to your advantage. Very well, said Frodo, trying to appear unconcerned. I I'll talk to you later.
Meanwhile, an argument was going on by the fireplace. Mr. Butterbur had come trotting in, and he was now trying to listen to several conflicting accounts of the event at the same time. I saw Mr. Butterbeer, said a Butterbur said a hobbit. Or at least I least ways I didn't see him if you take my meaning, he just vanished into thin air in a manner of speaking. You don't say, Mr. Mugwort, said the landlord, surprised. Yes, I do, replied Mugwort. Now mean what I say, what's more. There's some mistake here. Some mistake somewhere. First thing is, there was too much of that Mr. Underhill go, to go vanishing into thin air. Or into thick air, as is more likely in this room. Well, where is he now? cried several voices. What should I know? He's welcome to go where he will, so long as he pays in the morning. There's Mr. Took now. He's not vanished. And I say what I saw, and I saw what I didn't, said Mugwort obstinately. And I say there's a mistake, repeated Butterbur, picking up the tray and gathering up the broken cockery. Crockery. <laughs> I can't speak. Of course there's a mistake, said Frodo. I hadn't vanished. Here I am. I've just been having a few words with the strider in the corner. Came forward into the firelight. Most of the company backed away, even more perturbed than before. They were not the least satisfied by his explanation that he had crawled away quickly under the tables after he had fallen. Most of the hobbits and the men of Bree went off then, and there in a huff, having no fancy for the further entertainment that evening. One or two gave Frodo a black look, departed muttering among themselves. The dwarves and the two or three strange men that still remained got up and said good night to the landlord, not to Frodo and his friends. Before long, no one was left but Strider, who sat on unnoticed by the wall. Mr. Butterbur did not seem much put out. He reckoned, very probably, that his house would be full again on many future nights, till the present mystery had been thoroughly discussed. Now what have you been doing, Mr. Hunter Helias? Frightening my customers and breaking up my crocs with your acrobatics? I I'm very sorry to have caused me any trouble, said Frodo. It's quite an intentional, I assure you. A most unfortunate accident. All right, Mr. Underhill. If you're going to do any more tumbling or conjuring or whatever it was, you best warn folk before and warn me. We're a bit suspicious around here of anything out of the way. Uncanny, if you understand me. We don't take to it all of a sudden. I shan't be doing anything of the sort again, Mr. Butterbear, I promise you. And now I think I'll be getting to bed. She'll be making an early start. Will you see that our pon ponies are ready by 8 o'clock? Very good. Before you go, I should like a word with you in private, Mr. Underhill. Something has just come back to my mind that I ought to tell you. I hope that you'll not take it amiss. But I've seen a thing or two. I'll come along to your room if you're willing. Certainly, said Frodo. But his heart sank. He wondered how many private talks he would have before he got to bed. And what they would reveal. Were these people all in league against him? He began to suspect even old Butterbur's fat face of concealing dark designs. And we finished chapter 9. Oh my gosh, we're blazing through this fast tonight. And we'll be going on for a bit longer. Just need a re beverage myself with all this reading. Because I'm not street tomorrow. I'm okay with getting a trap. My throat that gets all hurty from <laughs> from yakking too long without any liquids. sure if we'll make it through this chapter, but through this next chapter, but we'll see what we get to. Oh, I might as well mention, um, 
So just as a reminder, on Friday at uh, or put in on the date correctly, or, or be precisely on the 9th at 8 p.m. Central Time, I'll be doing Pokemon Smasher Pass with Nyanfu. That 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 will be very cursed, um, for sure. Um, but uh, my next stream after this one will be on Thursday, um, where I will be continuing with uh, Higarashi. Um, and on. Um, and actually a week and a week so on the 13th I rhymed um, I'll be doing a special uh, stream with uh, good friend Geronimo Kido um, or we'll um, we're both going to be playing and you know going back and forth with voices uh, doing voices for a um a cute looking visual novel called Love at First Sight. You 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 meet uh uh a cute uh you you have a cute uh uh Cyclops girlfriend apparently. But it seems to be much more on like the wholesome side side than um than blurst it's like the alp the alpaca cake so that'll be fun actually let me go ahead and give on a kill a shout out for me Oh. oh my gosh, Sophie, thank you so much for, uh, for, oh my gosh, five, uh, uh, five subs. Oh my gosh, thank you so much. That's awesome. Christmas came early. Yes. I hope everyone enjoys the, um, um, your, your, the emotes. Yes. Aw, thank you. I'm, I'm glad you're, I'm glad you're enjoying it that much. Oh, okay. See, Aviat is, very, Aviat is very happy right now. Hmm. Uh, yes, enjoy. I hope you enjoyed getting to you to enjoy those. I just noticed, I think, um, I think Darjeeling is giving like every time a little thing plays now. It's, I think he was giving a, um, I think he plays. It's not uh, Wonderland. It's um. A, I think he plays every time he does. He plays a, a sleigh ride together with you. I swear I heard that little. Do that. It's just cool if it does. Not just visual. Thanks. Oh, and thank you for the fluid check. Chapter 10, Strider. Frodo and Pippin and Sam made their way back to the parlor. There was no light. Mary was not there, and the fire had burned out. 
It was not until they had puffed up the embers into a blaze and thrown on a, on a couple of sticks that they discovered Strider had come with them. There he was, calmly sitting in a chair by the door. Hello, said Pippin. Who are you and what do you want? I'm called Strider, he answered. Though you may have forgotten it, your friend promised to have a quiet talk with me. You said that I might hear something to my advantage, I believe, said Frodo. What do you say? Several things, answered Friday. Strider. But of course, I have my price. What do you mean? Asked Frodo sharply. Don't be alarmed, I mean just this. I will tell you what I know and give you some good advice, but I shall want a reward. And what shall be that, pray? Said Frodo. He suspected now that he had fallen in with a rascal, and he thought uncomfortably that he had brought only a little money with him. All of it would hardly satisfy a rogue, and he could not spare any of it. No more than it, no more than you can afford," answered Shredder with a low smile, as if he get guessed Frodo's thoughts. Just this: you must take me along with you until I wish to leave you. Oh, indeed," replied Frodo, surprised, not much relieved. Even if I wanted another companion, I should not agree to any such thing until I know a good deal more about you and your business. Excellent. Flame Strider crossing his legs and sitting back comfortably. You seem to be coming to your senses again, and that is all to be good. You have been much too careless so far. Very well, I will tell you what I know, and leave the reward to you. You may be glad to grant it, you have heard me. Go on then, said Frodo. What do you know? Too much. Too many dark things, he said. Strider grimly. Said Strider grimly. And as for your business got up and went to the door, opened it quickly and looked out. Then he shut it quietly and sat down again. I have quick ears, he went on, lowering his voice. No, I cannot disappear. I have hunted many wild and wary things, and I can usually avoid being seen if I wish. Now I was behind the hedge this evening on the road west to Bree, when four hobbits came out of the downlands. I need not repeat all that said to that they said to old Bombadil, or to one another. But one thing interested me. Please remember, said one of them, that the name Baggins must not be mentioned. I'm Mr. Underhill, if any name must be given. That interested me so much that I followed them here. I bought bits and I'm mad I don't have them yet. Oh. Hopefully they show up for you soon. I'm sorry they have a ch twitch in its chicanery. It's nerve-wracking when that type of stuff can happens. And I slipped over the gate just behind them. Maybe Mr. Baggins has an honest reason for leaving his name behind. But if so... I should advise him and his friends to be more careful. I don't see what interest my name has for anyone in Bree, said Frodo angrily, and I still have to learn why it interests you, Mr. Strider. I may have an honest ma reason for spying and eavesdropping, but if so, I should advise him to explain it. Well answered, said Strider laughing, but the explanation is simple. I was looking for a hobbit called Frodo Baggins. I wanted to find him quickly. I had learned that he was carrying out of the Shire, well, a secret that concerned me and my friends. Now don't mistake me, he- Now don't mistake me, he cried as Frodo rose from his seat. Sam jumped up with a scowl. I shall take care more of- I shall take more care of the secret than you do, and care is needed. He leaned forward and, look, and looked at them. Watch every shadow, he said in a low voice. Black horsemen have passed through Bree. On Monday, one came down the Greenway, they say, and another appeared later, coming up the Greenway from the south. There was a silence. Last, Frodo spoke to Pippin and Sam. I ought to have guessed it. From the way the gatekeeper greeted us, he said, and the landlord seems to have heard something. Why did he press us to join the company? Why on earth did we behave so foolishly? 
not to have stayed quiet in here. It would have been better, said Strider. I would have stopped your going into the common room if I could, but the innkeeper would not let me see let me in to see you or take a message. Do you think he and Frodo No, I don't think any harm of old Butterbur. Only he does not altogether like mysterious vagabonds of my sort. Frodo gave him a puzzled look. Well, I have a rather I have a rather rascally look, have I not? said Strider with a curl of his lip and a queer gleam in his eyes. But I hope we shall get to know one another better. When we do, I hope you'll explain what happened at the end of your song. For that little prank. It was a sheer accident, interrupted Frodo. I wonder, said Strider. Accident, then. That accident has made your position dangerous. Hardly, then, more than it was already, said Frodo. I knew these horsemen were pursuing me. Now, at any rate, they seem to have missed me and I have gotten away. You must not count on that, said Strider sharply. They will return. More are coming. There are others. I know their number. I know those riders. He paused and his eyes were cold and hard. There are some folk in Bree who are not to be trusted. But on. Bill Fernie, for instance. He has an evil name in Breland. Queer folk call at his house. You must have noticed him among the company. A swarthy, sneering fellow. He was very close with one of the southern strangers. They slipped out together just after your accident. Not all of those southerners mean well. And as for Fernie, he would sell anything to anybody or make mischief for amusement. What will Fernie sell? What has my accident got to do with him? Said Frodo, still determined not to understand Strider sense. News of you, of course, answered Strider. An account of your performance would be very interesting to certain people. After that, they would hardly need to be told your real name. It seems to me only too likely that they will hear of it before this night is over. Is that enough? You can do as you like about my reward. Take me as a guide or not. I may say that I know all the lands between the Shire and the Misty Mountains, for I have wandered over them for many years. I am older than I look. I might prove useful. We'll have to leave the open road after tonight. For the horsemen will watch it night and day. You may escape from Bree and be allowed to go forward while the sun is up, but you won't go far. They will come on you in the wild, some dark place where there is no help. Do you wish them to find you? They are terrible. The hobbits looked at him and saw with surprise that his face was drawn as if, as if with pain, and his hands clenched the arms of his chair. The room was very quiet and still, and the light seemed to have grown dim. For a while, he sat with unseeing eyes as if walking in distant memory or listening to sounds in the, in the night far away. There, he cried after a moment, drawing his hand across his brow. Perhaps I know more about these pursuers than you do. You fear them, but you do not fear them enough yet. Tomorrow you will have to escape if you can. Strider can, can take you by paths that are seldom trodden. Will you have him? There was a heavy silence. Frodo made no answer. His mind was confused with doubt and fear. Sam frowned and looked at his master. And at last he broke out. With your leave, Mr. Frodo, I'd say no. This Strider here, he warns and he says take care, and I say yes to that. And let's begin with him. He comes out to the wild, and I never heard no good of such folk. He knows something that's plain and more than I like. But it's no reason why we... We should let him go leading us out into some dark place, far from help as he puts it. Pippin fidgeted and looked uncomfortable. Strider did not reply to Sam, but turned his keen eye on Frodo. Frodo caught his glance and looked away. No, he said slowly. I don't agree. I think... I think you are not really as you choose to look. You begin to talk to me like the Bree folk, but your voice has changed. Still Sam seems right in this. I don't see why you should warn us to take care, and yet ask us to take you on trust. Why the disguise? Who are you? What do you really know about about my business, and how do you know, know it? The lesson in caution has been well learned, said Strider with a grim smile. Caution is one thing, and wavering is another. You will never get to Rivendell now on your own, 
and to trust me is your only chance. You must make up your mind. I will answer some of your questions, if that will help you to do so. And why should you believe my story if you do not trust me already? Still, here it is. At that moment, there came a knock. Does not shoot the music. Take a little. That moment, there came a knock at the door. Mr. Butterbur had arrived with candles, and behind him was Knob with cans of hot water. Strider withdrew into a dark corner. I've got. I've come to bid you good night, said the landlord, putting the ta candles on the table. Knob, take the water to the rooms. He came in and shut the door. It's like this, he began hesitating and looking troubled. If I've done any harm, I'm sorry, indeed. One thing drives out another, as you'll admit, and I'm a busy man. First one thing, then another this week's have jogged my memory, as the saying goes. Not too late, I hope. You see, I was asked to look out for hobbits of the Shire, for one by the name of Baggins in particular. And what has that got to do with me? asked Frodo. Ah, uh, you know best, said the landlord knowingly. I won't give you away, but I was told that this Baggins would be going by the name of Underhill, and I was given a description that fits you well enough, if I may say so. Indeed. Let's have it, then, said Frodo, unwisely interrupting. A stout little fellow with red cheeks, said Muster Butterbur solemnly. Pippin chuckled, but Sam looked indignant. That won't help you much. Goes for most hobbits, Marley says. He says to me, continued Mr. Butterbur with a glance at Pippin. But this one's taller than some, fairer than most, and he has a cleft in his chin. Perky chap with a bright eye. Begging your pardon, but he said it, not me. He said it, and who was he? Asked Frodo eagerly. Ah, that was Gandalf, if you know who I mean. A wizard, they say, is is. He's a good friend of mine, whether or no. Now I don't know what he'll have to say to me if I see him again. Turn all my ale sour or, or me into a block of wood, I wouldn't wonder. He's a bit hasty still. What's done can't be undone. Well, what have you done? Said Frodo, getting impatient with the slow unraveling of Butterbur's thoughts. Where was I? Said the Landarf, pausing and snapping his fingers. Ah, yes, old Gandalf. Three months back, he walked right in into my room without a knock. Barley, he says. I'm off in the morning. Will you do something for me? You've only to name it, I said. I'm in a hurry, said he. I've no time for myself, and when a message took to the Shire. Have you anyone can send and trust to go? You can find someone, I said. Tomorrow, maybe, or the day after. Make it tomorrow, he says. And then he gave me a letter. It's addressed plain enough, said Mr. Butterbur, producing a letter from his pocket and reading out the address slowly and proudly. He valued his reputation as a learned man. Mr. Frodo Baggins, Baggins, Hobbiton in the Shire. Letter from Gandalf, cried Frodo. Ah, said Mr. Frodo. You right name is Baggins. It, it is, said Frodo. You had better give me that letter at once and explain why you never sent it. That's what you can tell me, I suppose, though you've taken a long time to come to that point. Poor Mr. Butterbur looked troubled. You're right, master, he said, and I beg your pardon. Now I'm more afraid of what Gandalf will say if harm comes of it. But I didn't keep it back a purpose. I put it by safe. Then I couldn't find nobody willing to go to the Shire next day, nor the day after. None of my own folk were to spare. And then one thing after another drove it out of my mind. I'm a busy man. I'll do what I can to set matters right. And if there's any help I can give, you've only to name it. Leaving the letter aside... I promise Gandalf no less. Barley says, this friend of mine from the Shire may be coming out this way before long, him and another. He'll be calling himself Underhill, mind that. Do you ask, do you need ask no questions? And if I'm not with him, he may be in trouble and he may need help. Do whatever you can for him and I'll be grateful, he says. Here you are, trouble is not far off, seemingly. What do you mean, asked Frodo? Uh, these black men said the landlord lowering his voice. They're looking for Baggins. They mean well, and if they mean well, then I'm a hobbit. It was on Monday, and all the dogs were yammering and the geese screaming. Uncanny, I called it. Nob, he came, told me that two black men were at the door, asking for a hobbit called Baggins. 
Nob's hair was all stood on end. I bid the black fellows be off, slammed the door on them. They've been asking the same question all the way to Archit, I hear, and that ranger, Strider, he's been asking questions too. Tried to get in here to see you before you'd, before you'd had bite or sup, he did. He did, said Strider suddenly, coming forward into the light. Much trouble would have been saved if you had let him in, Barlaman. The landlord jumped with surprise. You! Right, oh, he's popping up. What do you want now? He's here with my leave, said Frodo. He came to offer his help. Well, you know your own business, maybe, said Mr. Butterbur, looking suspiciously at Strider. But if I was in your plight, I wouldn't take it up with a ranger. Then who would you take it up with? Asked Strider. A fat innkeeper who only remembers his own name because people shouted at him all day? They cannot stay in the pony forever, and they cannot go home. They have a long road before them. Will you go with them and keep the black men off? Me? Leave Bree. I, I wouldn't do that for any money, said Mr. Butterbear, looking quite... looking really scared. But why can't you stay here quiet for, for a bit, Mr. Underhill? What all these queer goings-ons are these black men after, and where did they come from, I'd like to know. I'm sorry I can't explain it all, answered Frodo. I'm tired and very worried, and it's a long tale. But if you mean to help me, not to warn you that you will be in danger as long as I am in your house. These black riders, I am not sure, but I think I fear they come from... They come from Mordor, said Strider in a low voice. From Mordor, Barlamin, if that means anything to you. Save us, cried Mr. Butterbur, turning pale. The name evidently was known to him. That is the worst news that has come to Bree in my time. It is, said Frodo. Are you still willing to help me? I, I am, Mr. Burr, more than ever. Though I don't know what the likes of me can do against... Against... He faltered. Against the shadow in the east, said Strider quick, quietly. Not much, Barlamin, but every little helps. You can let Mr. Underhill stay here tonight, as Mr. Underhill and you can forget the name of Baggins till he is far away. I'll do that, said Butterbur. They'll find out he's here without help from me, I'm afraid. It's a pity Mr. Baggins drew attention to himself this evening to say no more. The story of that bill of Mr. Bilbo's going off has been heard before tonight in Bree. Even our knob has been doing some guessing in his slow pate. There are others in Bree quicker in the uptake than he, than he is. No, we can only hope the riders won't come back yet. I hope not indeed, admit Butterbur. But spooks or no spooks, they won't get in the pony so easy. Don't you worry till the morning. Nob will say no word. No black rider shall come past my door while I can stand on my legs. Me and my folk will keep watch tonight. You had best get some sleep if you can. In any case, we must be called at dawn. We must get off as early as possible. Breakfast at 6.30, please. Right. I'll see you to the orders, said Lornward. Good night, Mr. Baggins. Uh, Underhill, I should say. Good night. Now bless me. Where's your Mr. Brandybuck? I don't know, said Frodo with a sudden anxiety. He had forgotten all about Mary, and it was getting late. I'm afraid he's out. He said something about going for a bit of air, a breath of air. Well, you do want... Not looking after, and no mistake, your party might be on a holiday, said Butterbear. I must go and bar the doors quickly, but I'll see your friend is let, let in when he comes. I'd better send Nob to look for him. Good night to you all. At last, Mr. Butterbear went out, with another doubtful look at Strider, and a shake of his head, his footsteps retreated, retreated down the passage. Well, Strider, when are you going to open that letter? Frodo, Frodo looked carefully at the seal before he broke it. Seems certainly to be Gandalf's. Inside, written in the wizard's strong but graceful script, script was the following message. Tip before I read. The Prancy Pony Bree, Mid Year's Day, Shire Year, 1418. 1418. Dear, dear Frodo, bad news has reached me here. I must go at once. You had better leave Bag End soon, and get out of the Shire before the end of July at least. 
I will return as soon as I can, and I will follow you if I can find that you are gone. Leave a message for me here if you pass through Bree. You can trust the landlord, Butterbur. You may meet a friend at the mine on the road. A man, lean, dark, tall by some called Strider. He knows our business and will help you. Make for Rivendell. There, I hope we may meet again. If I do not come, Elrond will advise you. Yours in haste, Gandalf. Yes. Not use it again. Not for any reason whatsoever. Not travel by night. EPS, make sure that is the real Strider. There are many strange men on the roads. His true name is Aragorn. Oh, I'm glad you're finding it co cozy to... Technically, Will. <laughs> I, li I like that name. But yeah, relax and enjoy the rest of it. Uh, we'll be ending soon, unfortunately, but I, I hope you've uh, uh, been enjoying the bit that, that you've been able to watch. And we will resume it. it. May not be on my usual time, but uh, I have a special um, event on Tuesday, so I may have to push it. A day. But normally, I would be continuing this every Tuesday at eight, starting at eight p.m. Central Time. All that glitters is not gold, but all those who wander are lost. The old that is strong does not wither. Deep roots are not reached by the frost. From the ashes a fire will, shall be woken. A light from the shadow shall spring. Renewed shall be a blade that was broken. The crownless again shall be king. EPPS. I hope Butterbear sends this promptly. A worthy man, but his memory is like a lumber room. Thing wanted always buried. If he forgets, I shall roast him. Careful. <laughs> uh oh. He in trouble now. Oh. Frodo read the letter to himself and then passed it to Pippin and Sam. Nearly old, nearly old Butterbear has made a mess of things, he said. He deserves roasting. If I had got this at once, we might have well been safe in Rivendell by now. What can have happened to Gandalf? He writes as he was going into great danger. He has been doing that for many years, said Strider. Frodo turned and looked at him, thoughtfully, wondering about Gandalf's second postscript. Why didn't you tell me that you were Gandalf's friend at once, he asked. It would say time. Would it? Would any of you have believed me till now? I knew nothing of this letter, but all I knew I had to persuade you to trust me without proofs. If I was to help you, in any case, I did not intend to tell you all at once about myself. I had to study you first, and make sure of you. The enemy has set traps for me before now. As soon as I had made up my mind, I was ready to tell you wherever you asked. But I must admit, he added with a queer laugh, that I hoped you would take me for my, take me for my own sake. A hunted man sometimes wearies of distrust and longs for friendship. But there, I believe, my looks are against me. They are at first sight, at any rate, laughed Pippin with a sudden relief after re reading Gandalf's letter. But handsome at, as handsome does, as we say in the Shire, I dare say we shall all look much the same after lying for days in hedges and ditches. It would take more than a few days or weeks or years of wandering into the wild to make you look like Strider, he answered. And you would die first unless you are made of sterner stuff than you look to be. Pippin subsided. Sam was not was not daunted, and he still eyed Strider dubiously. How do we know that you are the Strider that Gandalf speaks about? He demanded. You never mentioned Gandalf till this letter came out. You might be a play acting spy for all I can see, trying to get us to go with you. You might have done in the real Strider and took his clothes. Have you to say to that? That you are a stout fellow, answered Strider. I'm afraid my only answer to you, Sam Ganji, is is this. If I had killed the real Strider, I could kill you, and I should have killed you already without so much talk. If I was after the ring, I could have it now. He stood up and seemed suddenly to grow taller, and his eyes gleamed a light, keen and commanding. Throwing back his cloak, 
He laid his hand on the hilt of a sword that had hung concealed by his side. They did not dare to move. Sam set wide mouth staring at him dumbly. But I am the real Strider, fortunately, he said, looking down at them. His face softened by a sudden smile. I am Aragorn, son of Arathorn, and if by life or death I can save you, I will. There was a long silence. At last Frodo spoke without hesitation. I, I believe that you were a friend before the letter came, he said, or at least I wish to. You have frightened me so several times tonight, but never in the way that servants of the enemy would, so I imagine. I think one of the spies would, well, seem fairer and feel fouler, if you understand. I see, laughed Strider. I look foul and feel fair, is that, is that it? All that, all that is gold does not glitter. Not all though who, those who wander are lost. Did the verses apply to you then? asked Frodo. I could not make out what they were about, but how did you know that they were in Gandalf's letter if you had never seen it? I did not know, he answered, but I am Aragorn, and those verses go with that name. He threw out his sword, and they saw that the blade was indeed broken a foot below the hilt. Not much use, is it, Sam? said Strider, for the time is near when it shall be forged anew. Sam said nothing. Well, said Strider, of Sam's permission, we'll call that settled. Strider shall be your guide, and now I think it is time you went to bed and took what rest you can. We shall have a rough road tomorrow. Even if we are allowed to leave Bree unhindered, we can hardly hope now to leave it unnoticed. But I shall try to get lost at I shall try to get lost as soon as possible. I want I know one or two ways out of Breland other than the main road. Once we shake off the pursuit, I shall make for Weathertop. Weathertop? said Sam. What's that? It's a hill, just to the north of the road, about halfway from here to Rivendell. It commands a wide view all around. There we shall have a chance to look about us. Gandalf will make for that point if he follows us. After Weathertop, our journey will become more difficult. We shall have to choose between various dangers. When did you last see Gandalf? asked Frodo. You know where he is? Or what he is doing? Strider looked grave. I do not know, he said. I came west with him in spring. I have often kept watch on the borders of the Shire in the last few years, when he was busy elsewhere. He seldom left it unguarded. We last met in the first of May, at Sarn 4 down the Brandywine. He told me that his business with you had gone well, and that you would be starting for Rivendell in the last week of September. As I knew he was at your side, I went away on a journey of my own, and that has proved ill, for plainly some news reached him, and I was not at hand to help. troubled for the first time since I known him. We should have had messages, even if he could not come himself. When I returned many days ago, I heard the ill news. The tidings had gone far and wide, but Gandalf was missing, and the horsemen had been seen. It was the elven folk of Gildor that told me this, and later they told me that you had left your home. But there was no news of your leaving Buckland. I have been watching the East Road anxiously. Do you think the Black Riders have anything to do with it? With Gandalf's absence, I mean, asked Frodo. I do not know of anything else that they could have hindered him except the enemy himself, said Strider. But do not give up hope. Gandalf is greater than you f Shar folk know. As a rule, you can only see his jokes and toys. This business of ours will be his greatest task. Pippinion. I'm sorry, said I'm dead tired, in spite of all the danger and worry I must bed or sleep where I sit. Where's that silly fellow, Mary? It would be the last straw if we had to go out in the dark to look for him. At that moment, they heard a door slam, then feet came running along the passage. Mary came in and with a rush followed by Nob. He shut the door hastily and leaned against it. He was out of breath. They stared at him alarm for a moment before he gasped. I have seen them, Frodo. I have seen them. Black Riders. Riders, cried Frodo. Where? Here, in the village. I stayed indoors for an hour. Then, as you did not come back, I went out for a stroll. 
I had come back again and was standing just outside the light of the lamp looking at the stars. Suddenly, I shivered, felt that something horrible was creeping near. There was a sort of deeper shade among the shadows across the road, just beyond the edge of the lamplight. It slid away at once into the dark without a sound. There was no horse. Which way did it go? Which way did it go? Asked Strider suddenly and sharply. Mary started, noticing the stranger for the first time. Go on, said Frodo. This is a friend of Gandalf's. I will explain later. It, it seemed to make off up the road. Eastward, continued Mary. I tried to follow, of course. It vanished almost at once, but I went round the corner and as far as the last house on the road. Strider looked at Mary with wonder. You have a stout heart, he said, but it was foolish. I don't know, said Mary. Neither brave nor silly, I think. I could hardly help myself. I seem to have drawn somehow. Anyway, I went, and suddenly I heard voices by the ledge. One was muttering, and the other was whispering or hissing. I couldn't hear a word that was said. I did not creep any closer, as I began to tremble all over. Then I felt terrified, and I turned back, and I was just going to bolt home, when sudden something came behind me, and I, I fell over. I found him, sir, put in Nob. Mr. Butterbar was sent me out with a lantern, and went down to Westgate, then back up towards Southgate, just nigh Bill Fernie's house. I thought I could see something in the road. I couldn't swear to it, but it looked to me as if two men were stooping over something lifting it. I gave a shout, but when I got up to the spot where there, there was no signs of them, and only Mr. Brandybuck lying by the roadside. He seemed to be asleep. I thought I had fallen into deep water, he says, and when I shook him. Very queer he was, and as soon as I roused him, he got up and ran back here like a hare. I'm afraid that's true, said Mary. I don't know what I said. I had an ugly dream, which I can't remember. I went to pieces. I don't know what came over me. I do, said Strider. The black breath. The riders must have left their horses outside and passed back through Southgate in secret. They will know all the news for now, for they have visited Bill Fernie. And probably that southerner was a spy as well. Something might have happened in the night before something may happen in the night before we leave Bree. What will happen? said Bree. Will they attack the inn? No, I think not, said Strider. They are not all here yet. And in any case, that is not their way. In dark and loneliness, they are strongest. They will not openly attack where there are lights and many people. Not until they are desperate. Not while all the long leagues of Eriador still lie before us, but their power is in terror, and already some in Bree are in their clutch. They will drive these wretches to some evil work, Fernie and some of the strangers, and maybe the gatekeeper too. They had words with Harry at Westgate on Monday. I was watching them. He was white and shaking when they left him. He seems to have enemies all around, said Frodo. What are we to do? Stay here and do not go to your rooms. They are sure to have found out which those are. The hobbit rooms have windows looking north and close to the ground. We will all remain together and bar this window and door. But first, Nob and I will fetch your luggage. While Strider was gone, Frodo gave Mary a rapid account of all that had happened since supper. Mary was still reading and pondering Gandalf's letter when Strider and Nob returned. Well, masters, said Nob, I've ruffled up the clothes and put in a bolster down the middle of each bed. I've made a nice imitation of your head with a brown woolen mat. Mr. Bag, uh, uh, Underhill, sir, he added with a grin. Raven laughed. Very lifelike, he, he said. What will happen when they have penetrated the disguise? We shall see, said Strider. Let us hope to hold the fort till morning. Good night to you, said Nob, and went off to take his part to, in the watch on the doors. Their bags and gear they piled on the parlor floor. They pushed a low chair against the door and shut the window, peering out. Frodo saw that, that the night was still clear. The sickle was sinking bright above the shoulders of Bree Hill. He then closed and bars the heavy inside shutters and drew the curtains together. Strider built up the fire and blew out all the candles. The hobbits lay down on their blankets with their feet towards the hearth, but Strider settled himself in the chair against the door. They talked for a little. For Mary still had several questions to ask. Jumped over the moon, chuckled Mary as he rolled himself in his blanket. Very ridiculous of you, Frodo. But I wish I had been, been there to see. The worthies of Bree will be discussing it a hundred years hence. I hope so, said Strider. 
Then they all fell s silent, and one by one the hobbits dropped off to sleep. There we finished chapter 10. Oh wow, we made a lot. Did a lot. Got through a good chunk. Um. So yeah. Don't, um. So I'm not sure if I'll pick up. Because uh, the time I'll be doing that uh, special stream with Geronimo. It'll be on the 13th. Which is of course a week from. Which will be the same day as, as I do this stream next. Um, as I usually do this stream. So, uh, although I'll be doing that at 1 p.m., that'll be going on at 1 p.m. Central Time. Um, so, I guess it'll be a matter of how long it goes. <laughs> Thank you for the fluid check. So, how long that goes for. Um, and then uh, how I'm, I'm feeling. And I might still hold it, although it might end up being, although it will probably end up being shorter. Um, I could potentially, I might potentially just move it to do it on Wednesday. So I'm not sure. I'm just letting you know um, about that. But uh, next stream will be on Thursday at 8 p.m. Central for, um, uh, to continue with Higurashi, which is, since that's a visual novel, I end up doing all the reading, so uh, that's uh, hard stuff. So, um, you know, that's not everyone's thing. Um, and then, uh, uh, the, oh, yes, and of course, Friday, 8 p.m. Central Time, it's Pokemon Smasher Pass with Nyan. The, the author of all our lovely emotes. Um, so <laughs> that'll be very curt, um, for sure. And uh, I'm and I'll be and before the next time I stream Metal Gear Solid Three, I will. I'm I have some stuff. Um, I'll be working on to make sure that the technical issues we were having on, on uh, uh well last night do not occur. Um, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right. Let's see. Let's see. There's honey, honey, or a bun. Um, what right, a bun? Yet I better mark. There we go. Now, Mark. Reading. There we go. Don't want to. Don't want to miss that. Um, and of course, I will be uploading this to YouTube. Um, within the next uh day or so. Um, which will be up with all my other um, all the other streams of of this, which are on a nice playlist. Which also contains all my um, all my streams of um, of uh, Higurashi as well, as well as uh, a couple, a few other things. You, you enjoying the dramatic newt newt? Dramatic newt newt. Um. Uh. Let me do a quick of hello, Granite. Welcome. I hope you enjoyed thing. Um, but yes, that is my YouTube channel. Um, you'll want to look into that. Um, since I I upload like my reading as well as like if I do a visual novel, I upload that stuff up there. There's a few other readings from a while back. Um, if people are interested. Okay, but we are uh, going to rate Devabun. And thank you all so much for coming. Thank you for your continued support. Um, and uh, 
you all have a good night or day, whatever your time zone may be. Put in our raid message. And also, once again, thank you um, so much for the for the gift sub, Sophie. Just means it's so much for me. Uh, it means a whole lot. Yes. Good night. Um. Time. Let me turn it a version. But if you happen to have a tea related thing, or a drink beverage that will work with that, feel free to use that. Uh, Feel free to use that yourself. I like people seeing people. All right. I I will now play out with stuff. Y'all y'all have a good one. I can find the thing quick enough. There's something. What's going on?